Have fun. Welcome, welcome, welcome to stop number two of the Free Ride World Tour. The Free Ride family is back together in beautiful Ordino, Arcalis, Andorra. The Principality of Andorra sits high in the Pyrenees, nestled between France and Spain. It's an easy, beautiful drive up from Barcelona. And Ordino, Arcalis has become the jewel in the Andorran Free Ride crown. A spectacular backdrop for the Free Ride World Tour, offering a staggering number of free ride venue options all over the resort. Everywhere you look, free ride lives here. My name is Derek Foos. I am here with my co-host, Anna Smoothie. Anna, welcome to Andorra. Feeling good about the show so far? I am so excited. We've got snow. We've got an incredible roster of athletes, and I think it's going to be a great day. Yeah, very exciting times. It was a hustle to get here from Bakira Barrett. We had uh, a pretty limited window where the organizers felt that the snow was going to be good. So we moved everything. We moved everybody. Big props to the Freeride World Tour organizational team and especially the production team for the TV show. They moved all this equipment, got it all set up, have spent literally the whole time setting up. We've been sleeping, we've been chatting with athletes. These guys have been out here. They slept over up here on the mountain last night, but they got it done and we are ready to go for competition today. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna get a little look at what the day is gonna look like. Have a look at our schedule. All right, so we're gonna be dropping snowboard women at 10 a.m., those are our first categories. Then 10.30, the next crew to go, is the snowboard men. 11.10, ski women, the next category. And finally, at noon, ski men, finishing things off. Same order that we ran in Spain. So exciting times here for stop number two on the Freeride World Tour as we have our athletes making their way up to the summit. We've got our forerunner in the gate, that is young Whistler Freeride Club alumni, Wei Tian Ho. Extremely excited. This young man, Wei Tian, over here, he's really looking to find himself a spot on the Freeride World Tour. Peak performance rider, ready to kick things off and get the athletes hyped up. So Wei Tian is on course, working his way down the ridge there. We understand that some of the snow up there is quite tricky, but he is cruising through, making short work of it. He is down there underneath the ice cliff and finding a way through. So it looks like compulsory airs here. So let's see how he takes it. Clean, stomps, rides out with speed. So Forerunner's job is to make the athletes understand what the snow conditions are like and also kind of just stoke them out to get them excited on what's coming. So Wei Tian doing a fantastic job of that. A couple of clean airs so far, really making short work of this. As I said, Wei Tian looking to put himself onto the free ride world tour. A long send there. So Wei Tian Ho absolutely firing up the athletes that are hanging out down here. They're all waiting for their heli bump. Um, it's kind of a fun, a fun process here in Andorra, but we'll let Wei Tian finish. This is a snow test, 100% top to bottom, and it's really important that this goes well for Wei Tian because he wants to make the athletes get excited about their runs. And safe to say they'll be super pumped to see him send it, have clean airs and incredible landings. And he's opening it up through the bottom of the bowl there, and I think that will get the vibes pretty high. And I, I have to say, safe to say, I'm also pretty stoked. Wei Tian, a product of the Whistler Freeride Club. I've been working with this kid as a coach since he was 11 years old. And to see him put down that run as a forerunner uh, really warms my heart. He's, uh, he's definitely done his job. He arrived in Europe last night. Uh, had one night's sleep, had not seen the face, got some photos, rode up in the helicopter this morning and just did that. I'd say the future pretty bright for this young man. Yep, uh, what a, what a warm-up run after <laughs> flying over, not having much time on snow. Yeah, we're getting a little look at that entrance. Definitely tricky, but Wei Tian making short work of it. Finding the transition there. 
no time to settle into the rhythm and as he's right off this next one avoiding that rock so you can see it's a little firm he you know a touch sat down but he's been doing his squats so no problem there for Wei Tian to handle that and that's going to fire these athletes up and we can see the snowboard women wake, making their way up to the start they're ready to send and I'm sure they would be thrilled to hear that he's had a great run yeah absolutely so just a fascinating look at the uh, inner workings here, the Freeride World Tour. As we said, the athletes, the, the program for them a little different on this, uh, on this event. So they have a long hike from basically from the bottom of the mountain all the way to the finish area. But they do then get a helicopter ride from the finish area up to the summit, which is a nice little touch, a short hike from there. But if you miss your heli bump, maybe you slept in, then uh, you're going to be in trouble because, as we all know, if you snooze, you lose. That's right. So checking out the beautiful mountains of the Pyrenees here in Andorra. We've got a lot more snow this year than we did last year, and it's uh, it's a little firmer. Last year we had a, a bit of um, high temperatures that was making the snow degrade as the competition went on. So I think we're excited for a little more consistency this year. All right, we're going to get a look at the face preview here in Ordino Arcalis. So this face preview from Fat Map shows the Peak de la Plana. So you can see the start gate up there at 2,670 meters. We've got a vertical drop of 430 meters for the athletes. And it's got an average gradient of 37 degrees, but the steeps are pushing 45 to 50. You can see here that the lookers left of the venue is more east facing and it moves to more of a southeast aspect in the in the bowl there. So. Lots to work with, a bit of variation uh, across the face that athletes will have to plan into their lines, but I think it's a, it's a great venue. Yeah, and you can see here the, the stuff that's facing a little bit more east has been uh, touched a bit more by the wind, so the wind's definitely pressed it, but watching Wei Tian there and the earlier forerunner, uh, Berti, it's creamy, it's not, it's not too hard. The stuff that's dead south facing had, had a bit more sun on it yesterday. We saw a few rollerballs developing later in the afternoon. As you get a look, the takeoffs are looking nice and covered right to the edge, which is a huge, huge bonus for the athletes. They definitely want to see um, clean takeoffs uh, and not having to pre-pop or pre-ollie before they get to the lip. So all of these directions, all of these faces, really a nice opportunity for the riders to study their lines. Yeah, I think they're pretty hyped to have some good takeoffs there. Last year we saw a lot of pre-ollieing and also some uh, cliffs that had rocks projecting outwards that caught a few athletes. Yeah, absolutely. So conditions firing up, forming up for the athletes to get it done out here today on the Peak de les Planas. And we are going to take a little look further in. find a face, but warm weather is coming, so we have to hustle, hustle, hustle. It's time to panic. We just passed the border of Pandora. We made it. Is snowboard women kicking things off once again for stop number two here on the Freeride World Tour. The snowboard women are already up there, fired up and ready to go. Our first rider is gonna be Tiffany Perrotin out of France, the reigning Freeride World Champion, so she's pretty excited getting ready. She's definitely looking to get things going after what happened in Bikira. So in Bikira Barrette, we had Katie Anderson re-qualify for the World Tour and take the win, which was an incredible comeback tour for her. So a great start to the season. She's coming into this event with the golden bib. And yeah, we've uh, got some serious heavy hitters. We had the veteran Erica Vikander use her experience uh, to take out 
third place, and then Anna Orlova in second. Yeah, it was an interesting it was an interesting competition. We saw some of the women in the snowboard category uh, who really sent hard. I, I'd say I'd put Tiffany Pertin at the top of that list um, go down in competition, and then we saw I, I'd say safer runs from from Erica and Anna, and then Katie definitely kind of just blew the doors off with classic Katie. And I, I had a long chat with Erica, and she was kind of bummed because she wants to show her full potential, but also just understands the game enough to not do what's not doable uh, in the moment with the conditions. So here we go, we've got, this is the order that we're gonna run in. Tiffany Perrotin, current reigning world champion, is gonna be dropping first and then followed very closely by our last event winner. Fireworks expected in the category. We're gonna wrap up Anna Orlova, Michaela davis Mian, And then Estelle Rosolio is gonna wrap things up for snowboard women, another one who sent really hard in the, in the last event, but it didn't quite pay off for her, I think based just entirely on conditions. Yeah, she made an incredible debut big airs, incredible board handling skills, but unfortunately came unstuck on one of her landings. I think she's uh, not really gonna tone it back for this competition. She's excited to be here and she just wants to send it for snowboard women. Yeah, and I really, I gotta say, as a, as a fan of this sport, I appreciate that take on, on competition. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna put down your best run and, uh, and who cares what happens after that. But uh, let's take a look at what you guys thought for the Peak Performance Fun Bet. So we had Katie Anderson, the winner of the last event. Obviously, she is topping out the peak performance fun bet. And then our veteran rider, Erica Vikander, up there is 75%. And last year's world champion, Tiffany Perrotin, also taking a lot of votes from the audience there. I think that's uh, some solid voting. Yeah, solid voting there. You get a look at Katie Anderson just doing her final bits of prep work before we kick off the snowboard women's category. So nervous moments up there. This this is such a great view of the top of the Pic de las Planas. It's, um, it's really steep and there's no time for the riders to warm up into their runs. It's straight away into the action. So definitely some, some nervous moments uh, watching the riders studying lines. The lower part of the face, I think we're gonna get a bit more of an opportunity for the senders to send today. It's a little bit more open and I think maybe the one thing that really stands out to me, the snow's a little more consistent. Top to bottom, it's predictable and, and kind of trustworthy. So the athletes are gonna be able to, to open up the throttle, to let themselves off the leash a bit and really show what they've uh, what they've got in their bag. We heard from the judges last night that who have all been out on the face that at the top there we've got a lot of exposure. We also have an ice cliff which is making the snow quite firm there. So they were just encouraging athletes to really back themselves through that exposure, take it easy and then open it up a little once they get into the main part of the face. Yeah, and I think that's I think that's wise words. I mean you do have to you do have to consider what's below you when you're when you're making moves out here on on this face and and these athletes i mean they're they're not just talented and skilled they're also really smart it doesn't you don't just get here by being reckless and and sending when it's not the right time or not on the right spot on the face um, so I think the, the organizers putting a lot of faith in the riders that they're going to make good decisions on the, on the top part of the face and then be able to kind of really unleash as they get lower down. And we do have some closed areas. Obviously, there's some enormous cliffs out there that are just not in condition. I don't know if they're ever in condition, which are closed, but typically just leaning on the athlete's experience and wisdom to take on stuff that's doable today in these conditions. Yeah, so we gave it a little uh, a little bit of extra time for things to soften. As, as Anna said in the face preview, we've got uh, the pretty much dead south-facing section of this, which was definitely melted a little bit yesterday. Uh, temperature's quite warm here in Ordino Arcalis today, so the sun did its work this morning, and those bits are softened up. We're hoping they're going to stay in condition throughout the day. I think by starting fairly early in the morning here, we're going to be um, achieve success on that front and have pretty much prime conditions for, for all the riders. So you can see the setup there. Not a lot of space for riders to strap into their boards, to do their final prep, to get everything going that they, uh, that they need to do in the start gate. It's pretty tight up there. It is, but you can see our first rider, Tiffany Perrotin, doing some stretching, getting herself psyched up to send. 
Yeah, she's such an exciting rider to watch. For sure, the biggest air of the day in the snowboard women's category back in Bakira Barrett. Didn't quite manage to hold on to it. And in discussion with her, I think you told me this, she landed on a rock. So you can't really blame a rider for that. And we are underway here in Ordino Arcalis. Tiffany Periton, current world champion on course. She is a regular rider. And so this top section where you have to ride in on your heelside edge is actually a bit of a disadvantage for her, but she looks like she's got a strong heelside turn there, gently making her way down the ridge to access her line. Oh, and this just gives you the real picture of how exposed this is. And for a rider being on their heel side in this situation, I mean, you really got to back yourself and your skill. And Tiffany finding the way in there and now truly underway as she gets that first turn going. And this is really her first opportunity to feel out the snow on the face here, Anna. Yeah, and it's looking good. It's The snow is moving. She's making a dent in the face, and she's looking to find her first features. Yeah, so a couple solid turns here for Tiffany as she eases her way in. As I said, this is the this is the first opportunity for the riders to feel out the snow, make sure they know where they are where they are. And now coming down what looking like towards her first feature off the corner and dead bolts on her board. So underway truly now for Tiffany. Just linking some turns, finding the next cliff she's gonna hop and straight into some turns. Beautiful board control. Nice and square over her board. Uh, it's. I think it's going to be critical for the riders to stay balanced over the board and make sure they've got that edge engagement as the snow is still looking a little firm. And as she comes her way, way down to this rider's left section, this is where there's been the most wind effect on the face. So there's a bit of a creamy surface, but it's quite firm underneath. You can see Tiffany kind of bouncing around there as she makes her way across into this next section of features. And we did see a forerunner come through there, and that's his track that she's just gone past. She is li lining up a big air here, a chunky one, finds the landing pad, stomps it. That was a sick air from Tiff. All right, so clean riding so far from the champ as she comes down into this slightly wind touch section and looking like she's going to just make her way over to this last feature. This is a big one. A lot of riders commenting on how flat the landing was. Tiffany's going to get onto her toe side and into the takeoff. And taking it cross court and riding out clean. A sick run from Tiffany Ferretin. All right, well, what a way to get the snowboard women's category started. Um, it's, it's always a bit of a coin toss for which category is going to go first. And, and often there's, there's either jealousy from the ones who don't get to go first or a bit of grumbling from the ones who have to go first. You never quite know, but Tiffany kicking things off with a bang there. And I think that's going to be really encouraging for the rest of the riders up in the start gate. For sure. If, if the first rider lands their run on their feet, it gives them so much confidence. So this is our first air. Riding out on her heelside edge beautifully. And, and, and then takes another one there and crosses over to the looker's left of the face where she gets her biggest air time. Perfectly spotted, gets the grab. And powerful in that landing for Tiff, and then just lining up, making sure she's in the right spot on this bottom air. Another one nice and clean, finding the right trajectory, finding the right pace. Uh, I, I'm, I'd be curious to know if Tiffany decided um, to tone things back, because you saw in the judges bar there, the fluidity was a little low, and I think that's based on pace, but also riding to the conditions. You know, it, with the snow the way it is, with this bit of wind scouring, if you release into the fall line, you're going to pick up speed quick, and it can be hard, especially when you only have one edge, um, to, to be able to slow that down. So a 75 for Tiffany Periton. That is a great way to open up the category. And she is going to be pleased with that run. She was definitely feeling a bit hungry after uh, after the, the rock escapade in the last event. So good to see the champ coming back swinging. All right, well, you can hear the audio from our Finnish, uh, Finnish camera mic picking up the cheers for Tiffany as we head back to the top for Fernie's own Katie Anderson. She's wearing that golden bib for the current tour leader sitting in first place overall with a win under her belt. Katie has been on the tour. She did two years. Then last year, she went back to the Challenger Tour. Um, and she didn't make the cut. She had a bit of a weird, a weird season last year, but then picked it back up on the Challengers, won the overall, and is back here on the Freeride Tour, Freeride World Tour, with a win under her belt. 
And I'm just loving the energy from Katie this year. She seems so confident, happy, stoked on her line choice. And yeah, she's making her way down the ridge here. The snow is quite tricky in that top section. It's been touched by the wind and the sun. And she's of course riding through here as a regular rider on our hillside edge, but moving through with some good fluidity. Yeah, opting for that same high line that we saw Tiffany take, but adding a little feature on the top and a little feature on the exit. So already pushing up from uh, from what we've seen so far. And now Katie making her way through this section. You can see a couple old tracks there. Nice to see riders leaving tracks. And another one for Katie. So she's stacking the features up so far. She's stacking some smaller features, but bringing some more fluidity really nicely, actually. Just building that line score and showing some beautiful snowboarding. Yeah, and Katie coming from that World Cup board across background, she's not afraid to go fast, and you know her edge control is good. With a little grab there, a slightly different uh, trajectory than we saw um, than we saw Tiffany take. I'm getting the nose grab there, so Katie adding the freestyle elements. That has definitely not been her wheelhouse back, you know, through her snowboard career coming from racing. But she talked about really wanting to add that that flair to her riding. And we certainly saw that in Becerra Barrett, where she was um, getting the grab on most of her airs. So she's looking really com confident, fluid, and fast. Heading over to the lookers left section that where Tiff was, and taking on the same air, but with quite a bit of pace, shooting over her bomb hole. That was a sick one from Katie. Yeah, another stomped one on that biggest air that we've seen so far, and adding a feature on the way to the last one. So Katie controlling her speed there as she comes down towards this final set and opting for a different takeoff than we saw. And another clean one, Katie Anderson now just zooming out towards the finish. So what a start for snowboard women. This is what we're here for. Yeah. Yeah, they're absolutely killing it. Stoked to see them put runs to their feet and take on some serious features. Yeah, I mean, the dream for for fans, for us in the commentary booth, for the organization, is 100% of the field stomps their runs and you leave it in the judges' hands. And these two women so far have made a great effort towards that. That was a fantastic run for Katie Anderson. So getting the grab there on her top air. And this one she took with some serious pace, flying over to bomb hole and riding out strong, like uh, combining awesome features and great riding. Yeah, and like that one, and in all, all of her lower features, Katie getting her hand to the board. So air and style is a category that the judges are looking at, and that is gonna make a big difference if you add those little bits every time, that little pepper into the soup. Oh, and an 85, three, three for Katie Anderson coming back. It's gotta be hard feeling the pressure wearing the golden bib after a win, but Katie Anderson handling the pressure on her shoulders, and Tiffany Periton's stay in the hot seat, cut short. Unfortunate for her, but fortunate for Katie Anderson as the Canadian takes her spot in the Dynastar hot seat. Looking extremely comfortable there. All right, well, we have no rest for free riders as we go right back up to Anna Orlova. She was second in the first event of the year. We've seen Anna Orlova on the tour and then not make the cut, go back to the qualifiers, still finish strong there. But what a great start for her this season. I think we're looking at a brand new mindset for Anna Orlova. Yeah, she's absolutely ki killing it. And we had such a quick turnaround that she excused herself from dinner last night, dined and dashed to go and lock in her line. And she's just pausing up there on the ridge, seeing where to get her entrance from. She's got a bit of uh, wind from the helicopter just above her, which can be quite distracting. I wonder if the judges will give her some tolerance on that one. Yeah, so Anna making her way down this extremely exposed section. And we've just had news from the judges that they've actually lowered the judging line due to that exposure above where Anna is. So she's only just entering the judge zone right now. Hence why she's probably taking her time finding the perfect entrance. So Anna Orlova riding Goofy Foot, giving her a bit of an advantage, I'd say, coming in there on the toe side edge, and it looked definitely like a smoother, cleaner exit, or, yeah, exit for her from that section as she comes down into a new part of the face that we haven't seen any of the snowboard women take on yet. Popping through the rocks on the heel side and looking like she's lining up this lower boulder. Takes it to her feet. And she's working away over to the right, uh, looker's right. 
and takes another small feature off the side of that one. And as you can see these roller balls, this is the more south facing aspect. So this had a bit more sun on it yesterday. I'm not sure exactly how soft it is for the riders just yet. It's definitely gonna change. Is Anna taking on another one right out of the fall line onto that heel side edge. So nice clean riding from Anna Orlova in this tricky snow on the other side of the face and the other two snowboard women opted for catching the grab on that one. All right, so Anna Orlova opening up a new section of the face here. And she's got another feature here below her. Does it have a takeoff? That's the question. She makes one and rides out clean, linking some turns. All right, well, Anna Orlova now just pointing it in the lower section of the face. Is she going to be able to hold the speed? Of course she is. On the heel side, Anna Orlova coming down to this lower basin and another clean run from the snowboard women's field. So really starting off strong here in our opening category. Anna Orlova, she's got a second under her belt already. I mean, worst she could do so far is third, but we do still have three very hungry women at the top ready to shred this face. I think that was a solid line that she put together, but I think the previous two riders might have ridden with a little more fluidity. So let's see what the judges make of that. You can see riding her heelside edge down and washing a bunch of speed. It's a decent air there and she rides out controlling it, but I think she might have lost some points on fluidity before and after there. Yeah, definitely packing a bunch of features into this run and showing the control. Um, it, it quite, quite, difficult snow conditions on this side. You can see it's already starting to ball up, but Anna handling it. Um, so a nice clean run there as we wait for the judges to have their say. Scores coming in for Anna, 66-67. So they've had their say, and Anna Orlova sliding into third. So Katie Anderson hanging on to that top spot so far. Um, nothing is safe, though, until the category is done. It's going to be interesting to see how the judges read the different sections of this face, if they're going to take into account the snow conditions on the right side, uh, the riders left. Um, where it did freeze a little bit overnight, or if that's they put that in the hands of the riders. Um, we, to we've got Michaela Davis Meehan. She uh, had a tumble in the first event in Bikira Barret, but she was going huge. So I'm really excited to see. Again, I don't think she's going to tone it back for Ordina Arcalis. I think she's going to bring the heat. Yeah, I don't think toning it back is in Michaela's vocabulary. She rides at one speed, and she is ready to kick her campaign off here in Ordino Arcalis in Andorra. The Aussie rider, Michaela Davis Mia, on course. And of course, Aussie riders don't always have the best snow at home, so she's used to adverse conditions. I'd be interested to see which side of the face she chooses to drop in on, because I know that she can handle tricky snow. She sure can. She's been doing her training in Revelstoke in the uh, in the pre-competition season, so she may have started to get used to really good snow conditions. She's been riding a lot of powder there, but she's opting for this same entrance. Regular foot rider, so coming in on that heel side definitely gets the heart going at the top of your run. Yeah, and she's taking her time as she's just approaching the judging line now, so she can open it up. She's working her way through between those rocks and finding her line. All right, so Michaela heading over to the rider's right side and now coming right down into the heart of this over the wind lip, catching a little bit of transition on the back side of that. So opening things up now just cutting through those roller balls. You can see those are not just frozen overnight, but probably frozen in place. So definitely going to have an effect on your board under your feet. Yeah, tricky cookies and just moving with great fluidity through that exposed zone there, but needs to find some more cliffs to add to her air and style. Yeah, we definitely saw a couple of the earlier riders taking on a bunch of features in that section. I'll clean one for Michaela as she just sheds a little bit of speed. So now we're really into things for Michaela, adding another one. So two big airs back to back in a row and coming into another kind of untapped section on the face here. Lining up the long jump and riding out with good speed. All right, so Michaela Davis Mia now into the bottom part of the apron on this Peak de las Planas face and through. You can see it sort of canyons out as the as the terrain rises up on both sides and the riders have this little bit of a, a cruise down. And looking like in this section, slightly different maybe from the last comp, it's probably a bit safer. It looks fairly smooth, fairly consistent and pretty predictable. Well, actually, in that bottom section, you can see in her track that it's a little bit... Uh, 
it's a little bit, you can see that there's some variation in the snow. So I think it's not so easy at some points where the wind's done its work. Taking that one cross court, controlling the speed and lining up this one, which is a beautiful stomp. She's so well balanced on her board and links together another feature there. This is her bottom cliff. And navigate some sharks in the landing there. Great S stuff. So solid centered over her board. You can see all smiles now in the finish area as we see a very direct fall line route from, uh, from peak to finish arch. So Michaela now anxiously waiting for the judges' scores to come in. And the judges have a 63-3-3 for Michaela davis Meehan. So that's going to put her into fourth place currently as we have seen... We've seen some really, really strong runs from the snowboard field, and I think for, for Michaela there, the line is the factor. Um, we saw both um, both Katie and Tiffany, and even Anna to an extent, just more features, especially at the top. And one of the things that the judges mentioned in the riders' meeting when they were talking about their criteria, they, they don't want to see riders passing features, leaving them undone, um, that either other riders did or that they, they felt they could do. But we are straight back up. Erica Vikander, she has been become uh, a fixture on the tour and a fixture on the podium vice champion last year. Erica's on course. Yeah, she has an incredible collection of podiums to her name. 18 podiums and 24 free ride world tour starts, which is pretty sensational. She is a goofy rider, so she's going to have a little bit of an advantage working her way through this exposed zone on a toe side edge. 18 podiums in 24 starts. That is an incredible accomplishment. Basically, uh, she's on the podium every time unless she crashes, which is pretty rare for Erica. She's really got great balance, great board control. This year, working extra hard on the fitness, um, strength and conditioning and stuff to make sure that she was ready to kick her free ride world tour campaign and making short work of that technical section up there. That was the fastest we've seen anybody come through there. Yeah, I always back her to move through exposed zones with great fluidity, taking an air there, getting a grab. All right, so Erica really starting things off in earnest, not wasting any opportunity to fly off a cliff as she comes down into this exposed zone. Lots of different ways out of here, and Erica opting for a new one on that long and low, super clean and absolutely in control. Big slash turn there. Erica said she wanted to do a run she was proud of. Well, she is well on her way to that. This is a strong run for the American rider. Yeah, I'm really stoked for her. She's had back issues, but as you say, she's been looking after her health and just kind of prioritizing that. And she is looking so strong on the face right now. Riding fast, ticking off more features, and just, yeah, I think this is the fastest pace we've seen. Yeah, she's unleashing on the face. And another rider now opting for a totally untapped zone as she flies down around the corner into this lower canyon on her heel side. So a really good run for Erica Vikander, opening up a new section of the face. Uh, the only rider that we saw over that windlip section actually be going fast enough to catch air on it. So fluidity through the roof there for Erica Vikander. Uh, another strong run, snowboard women just blowing the doors off this morning. What a great way to start the Free Ride World Tour Comp here. Happy to see it. And I hope she is stoked with that run. All right, well, let's take a look back at Erica's run. So control is so jacked. That was beautiful snowboarding, uh, linking features so well. I think her line choice meant that she wasn't able to stack as many features in as some of the riders, but she executed them beautifully. Yeah, you could see her just laying on the tail of the board there, uh, a little bit more wind in that zone, so slightly breakable surface on the top. But uh, Erica... Oh. Taking a knee. All right, well, there we see Katie Anderson sitting in the hot seat. Sitting on an 85-3-3. Erica Vikander now waiting for the score with a clean run. And, and the highlight of that one for me for sure was the pace she rode top to bottom. Just great technique. So here you see our judges panel. We've got uh, Bertie Denevo. We've got Rachel Croft, Lola Bess and um, Laurent Gauthier, all the most experienced judges you could ever hope for on, on a judging panel for, for any level. But for Freeride World Tour, these, these, uh, these judges definitely know what they're looking at. 
10 looking for is the score coming in for Erica, 64-67, putting her into fourth place. So another big challenge fended off by the Canadian, Katie Anderson, looking to go back to back here on the Freeride World Tour and really get things going with a bang. Big hugs from the two riders as they, uh, I mean, they're competitors, but they're really only competitors for the short time they're in the runs and the rest of the time, Erica's just trying to figure out where to go. <laughs> And we head straight back up to the top of the the, uh, the mountain here for Estelle Rosolio. She's a rookie on the tour, but certainly not a rookie to free riding. She's been around. We saw her going huge in the last event, not quite able to hold it. But as you said, Anna, she didn't care. She was happy with what she did, and she wants to try to do it again, but keep it on her feet. Absolutely. So she's riding in as a goofy foot rider, meaning that she can work through the exposure on her toe side, a great advantage for her to give her a little confidence at the top of her run. Uh, and we've also mentioned that the judging line is below where she's at right now, so she's under no pressure to send it, but she's moving through quite quickly. Yeah, over that exposure, maybe feeling a bit lucky to be a goofy foot there as she comes across. And into this lower section, trying to catch a piece of the corner of that air that we haven't seen anybody get, but it's a tricky one to access because you've got a rock above it that kind of just gets right in the middle in the way of your turn. So now Estelle coming into the heart of the face as she makes her way down onto this feature and clean onto her board. So a strong start for Estelle Rosolio. Yeah, she's kicking up some snow there and lining up her next air. She takes deep and just riding up beautifully with some real pace. She is working her way to the looker's right of the face, where we've got a lot more features to stack into her line. I think for all categories, the rider's really appreciating a little bit more consistency in the snow condition, snow quality. Estelle getting a double there. Sick one, comes out with a big heelside turn. Yeah, controlling the speed now, coming into this rocky lower section, and looks like she's opening it up. Can she hold it? This is a little bit bumpy through here, and she's looking super fast, and this section is quite icy, but she is handling it. Yeah, you could see her board flexing and oscillating there, but she stayed dead center over top of it. I really think that the, the more consistent and predictable conditions are, are going to allow all categories, but we certainly saw it here in Snowboard Women, to open things up a little bit more, and this face a bit more conducive to speedy riding. Mm. You know, faster is better on here, especially you can see all of them really releasing from quite high to, to let go of things and, and totally trusting their board handling skills to uh, to manage the speed and the, and the snow conditions. So checking out her top airs there. Air and style is really jacked. The judges are impressed with what they've seen from Estelle. And this one, she turns into a double perfectly balanced over her board. Yeah, loving the way she controlled her speed after the second step of that double. Quick heel side slash, never looked like she was out of control or gonna be, uh, gonna be going down on her butt or anything like that. But you do have to control the speed. It, you know, she's still, I think, too high on the face to completely let it go. That was a really, really well executed run from Estelle. And we have a 100% stomp rate from the snowboard women. So fantastic category there as Estelle was our last rider. Now it's in the judges' hands to decide where this last rider is gonna fall in. Is she gonna trouble Katie Anderson in the hot seat? We have our say, a 69-3-3. So Estelle moving herself onto the podium in third place. A really strong comeback after a tough crash for the rookie in Bakira Barrett which means that Katie Anderson has backed up her win and will be holding on to that golden bib. Yeah, let's have a look at how that all shook out as we get the final rankings for the snowboard women. Katie Anderson backing up her win in stop number one with another gold medal here. Tiffany Perton and Estelle Rosolio coming back from tough crashes in the last event to put themselves on the podium. Anna Orlova in fourth, Erica Vikander, Michaela davis Meehan rounding out the category. So what a way to start a comp here in the Freeride World Tour in Ordino Arcalis, the snowboard women blowing our doors off. The whole field stomped. Everybody rode great. That was a fantastic show. I'm so stoked to see it. And I think the other riders in different uh, divisions will be so thrilled to hear that snowboard women sent it very successfully. So here is our podium. Katie in number one there with Tiff Peraton in second. 
and Estelle Rosilio, our wild card rookie in third position. Well, let's see what this has done to the overall picture, Anna. So Katie remains victorious at the top of the ranking there. Anna Orlover is still in second place. And our wildcard rookie Estelle Rosolio slips into third position in the Freeride World Tour ranking. Well, Katie Anderson, with such a solid run from top to bottom, I think we're going to stop talking now about Katie in events and start talking about Katie looking like a very strong title contender. Absolutely. Hiking to venue face inspection. I'm going to go to the first one. I'm going to go to the first one. I'm going to go to the first one. We had a great start to the event. Now the snowboard men up there going through their final preparations, finding the mental uh, fortitude to get themselves into place. Let's take a look at what our overall rankings look like for snowboard men. So we've got Michael Morn coming into this competition in the golden bib and our rookie Holden Samuels had an absolute steamer in Becerra Barrette. He's in second place and the veteran Ludo Guillaudiat in third position. Yeah, looking at these overall rankings, there's a few heavy hitters who are a bit lower down after the first event with uh, maybe not quite the runs they were looking for, not quite what they were hoping to put down. So we saw already in snowboard women uh, a big change, a big shakeup, and we're going to see, I think, the same thing, at least the attempt for the same thing in snowboard men. So let's take a little bit of a look at the order we're going to run in. The riders all stacked up there at the top, ready to go. We're going to begin the category, of course, with our French rider, Camille Armand. He, he did manage to put down a fourth, but it was with some pretty serious baubles, and then Holden Samuels just really flooring all of us. As we move down, we see Cody Bramwell. He's one that's going to be hungry for a big result here because he didn't get what he wanted in the last one. The rookie, Liam Rivera, freestyle. I mean, he's he's going to be a, a force. And then Hans Midnick closing off the category. Another one we were really excited to see a full potential ride from. Peak performance, fun bet. Let's see what you thought. So despite having an absolute roller coaster of a run in Bikira Barrette, Cody Bramwell is still leading the peak performance fun bet. Camille Armand, he had a second place here last year. He's a strong bet as well. And uh, Michael Morn, our leader from wearing the golden bib, is also up the top there from your votes. Yeah, hard to bet against, uh, well, any of those guys, really. I mean, we had a good chat about that on the Free Ride World Tour podcast. Mark and I talking about some of those riders, how difficult it is to choose who you want to who you want to vote for. Um, do, you, do you go with your head? Do you go with your heart? Do you go with the riders you want to win? But this man, Cami Armand, kicking things off. He had a storming year last year on the Freeride World Tour, and he's looking to find success here in, uh, in Ordino Arcalis again. So Cami Armand is on the face. A regular foot rider working his way through a super tech section here, which I believe is still above the judging line, but he's just getting after it anyway. Oh, that was an unbelievable move. So I had I had word just, Anna, as you were chatting, that the judging line, the lower one, was just going to be for snowboard women. So that should be in play for Camille Armand as he made short work of that with that frog hop in the middle of the couloir to be able to fit his board through. And now picking up some pace as he comes down towards his first feature. Lining it up nicely, looking really strong and hitting over some sizey cliffs there. 
stomping it and oh. riding out clean with some real pace. Finding the perfect takeoff on that one to allow a nice transition back onto the snow as Cami now comes into the central part of this face here in Ordino Arcalis as there are plenty of options beneath him. Which one is he going to choose? Big backflip there and a bit of a tumble. Oh, Cami Armand just not quite able to hold it. You saw him scorpion. Now he's just trying to catch the heel side edge so he can slow down. Hopefully Cami's okay. That looked like a tough one. The second bounce definitely pushed him into a big scorpion. Just Cami Armand trying to catch his breath. All right, we've got the wave. For those at home, that means a rider's okay. Uh, it, but definitely, you know, when you go through a situation like that, you're going to need to take a second to gather yourself and, and figure out if you are okay. That was a big impact. He's looking pretty sore, so our thoughts are with him as he makes his way down to the finish. Wow, well, Kami Armand definitely giving it everything on that backflip. That was a large air. Snow conditions in the landing looking a little bit rough as I think he got bounced. I mean, we'll, I'm sure we'll get another look at it. But for Kami Armand, that's a tough one for him as it was looking really strong up at the top. So the French rider going down on a signature move of his. Kami Armand backflip, you can always count on it. That one, unfortunately, not working out for him. He's been a real regular on the podium in season 2022 so I think he was really looking to blow the doors off here and get back up there but unfortunately that one did not work let's check out this super tech move you see he rides a lot in Chamonix with that maneuver yeah that was just incredible he and not even a hesitation he knew exactly what he had to do and did it perfectly and then this first air so strong in the landing And the backflip looks clean. It's, I, I need to ask him what happened in the landing there because it looked like he was reasonably balanced on his board. Yeah, I think the snow conditions maybe just not quite playing into to the, the size of the air. It definitely looked like a hard bounce um, and really hard for Cami to hold on to that. So that's not going to be a score that he was looking for. He's asking if he should go to the hot seat. Um, <laughs> Cami Armand's going to go sit down and uh, take stock, re regroup his life there. All hugs in the finish area from uh, his compatriot, Tiffany Pertin. And here we see the start gate scene. We've got Holden Samuels in the start, the other riders ready to do it. Holden Samuels, what a <laughs> strong start for this young man on the Freeride World Tour. Came out of the gate relatively unknown to, to a lot in the bigger picture Freeride World. Um, of course, in the North American Freeride World, Holden well known. He's fast, he's got tricks. Ooh, His board go. control is second to none and he is jacked up, 23 years old. First year on the Freeride World Tour and he's already got a silver medal for his trophy case. Yeah, silver medal, and I hear that we have not seen uh, everything in his skill set. He's got plenty more in the tank, so I'm excited to see what he puts together for us on the face today. He's a goofy foot rider, so we'll be working through this top section with a little bit of an advantage there. Can dig his toe side edge in. There's a little pause heading towards the same chute that we saw Cami take a different uh, different option though, just pointing his nose through instead of that hop. And now he has to manage all this speed. When you put your board in the fall line like that, you're gonna pick up speed quick when it's that steep. Needs to find his first feature. As we mentioned, if you ride past them, the judges are gonna dock you, but he finds a massive one there, but a little butt check in the landing. Yeah, and you could see from his bomb hole that he was a tiny bit short on that. There was a wind rib from the Rockwell Backside three there, looking strong. Obviously, that didn't shake him too much. Yeah, so Holden definitely not rattled by that little uh, that little short on that one. And coming into this lower section, we saw this one go earlier. Holden getting the grab nice and clean on the board, and he's going to come screaming out the bottom section of this. So really creative run. That transfer at the top almost worked. It was so close. Um, Hard to judge distance on this face. A lot of the a lot of the cliff faces actually are not as vertical as they look from the bottom when riders are checking through their binos. They do go out a fair bit. The rocks are kind of stacked up like Lego, um, and and that one just just not quite the trajectory or distance that he needed. A little more speed might have been needed, but he made it work and uh, stuck to the rest of his line. So we'll see what the judges make of it. Well, I just love this entrance, putting the board in the fall line and committing to the pace 
And you can see his board's getting bucked around, but his upper body's staying nice and quiet. And this is the air where he comes up a little bit short, just hitting the edge of a wind lip in the landing and having a butt check. Yeah, you can see here the edge of the rock well. He just caught the upside of it. He tried to roll his board over and kind of lay into the front foot to set it down, but then this back three perfectly executed, so clean right into that heel side carve. So that, that kind of had flashes of both. You know, there was a, a big control issue, but then the rest of the run was sick. All right, so the judges throwing a 66-6-7. That's a bit of a look at what could have been. If Holden had landed that uh, that transfer, it would have been a huge score. Still, 66-6-7 with a crash is a solid score for Holden, but uh, it, it, it's, not, it's not a guarantee as we have still seven of the best snowboarders in the world up at the top ready to have their say on this. So a clean run is definitely going to be uh, going to be able to push Holden out of the hot seat. And speaking of clean runs, Ludo Guillaudia, he had 37 years old, one of the strongest guys on tour. His run in the last event was fantastic. So technical and we're real. I'm really excited seeing this kind of new Ludo on the Freeride World Tour. He's stomping runs and he's really picking creative lines. His ability to quickly link big features really astounded me in the last event. So he's also heading into this shoot that's, oh no, he's not. He's cutting his way across, which means he's having a bit of trouble there up on the shelf. Oh, Ludo going for what was sort of previously been the skier's entrance across there on the heel side, now putting himself on the toe side and starting off with a bang. Ludo, perfect landing. You can see him land in the exact same spot as Wei Tian Ho, the forerunner earlier. So that is a really strong way to start. Super scary to get over there on your heel side edge. But he backed himself, gets the grab on that next air. What is he lining up for us next? Ludo just so strong and balanced over his board, slashing that wind drift and coming high on this one, straight off the nose and another stomp for Ludo Giodiat. This is a great run so far as he's looking to link up even more features. And coming out hot. Floating that wind lip and it looks like he's gonna head over to the section that really paid off for some of the snowboard women. Nope, dropping down. A little bit lower, but Ludo has a big feature lined up underneath him here as big he tosses backy. a backflip. And Ludo stomping the Wildcat backflip there that was so well executed. It such a perfect landing. And now coming into this maze in the lower section, we haven't seen anyone ride through here. Can he find some features to top off this epic run? Well, plenty of stuff still below him as it looks like he's got another one lined up, catching the corner of that. Slightly more wind affected, and Ludo now pointing it out the bottom. He's just got to hold on through this wind affected section. One more compression as we pull back from a magnificent run there from Ludo Giodiat. He has really found his spot. The balance between enough and, and too much and Ludo riding the line of that perfectly, top to bottom, that run was absolutely spectacular. So this was a perfect stomp accessing. It was a little bit more tricky for him on his heel side edge, but the features that he stacked up afterwards were just phenomenal. And just riding with real pace and expertise. Yeah, finding the transition on that one perfectly. You can see him just that sole hand drag and then the backflip on that right to his feet, not even a touch of the hand, Holden Samuels in the hot seat, loving it. Oh, that was a great run there from Ludo. Such a smooth line and big features all the way through, top to bottom. There was never, a, uh, there was no downtime in that run at all. So now the judges getting to work. I mean, obviously with con Holden's control issue. So an 82 there for Ludo and he takes over the hot seat. Uh, wow, well the snowboard men delivering once again as we have, uh, as we have come to expect them to. Into the Dynastar hot seat, French rider Ludo Guillaudia. So we've got Cody Bramwell here who is hungry for a podium result. He didn't uh, have the finish he wanted in Bikera Barret, got a little bucked. Um, a Swedish guy riding up for Great Britain and he's had some really solid results over the last season. So definitely a contender for Ordino. Yeah, Cody Bramwell, really a man of the world, spending his summers in Greece running boat tours. Um, and as you said, he's British, but he's also Swedish. He's kind of, he's, he's a truly an international rider. 
looking to get things started. Cody Bramwell hungry for a big result here, and I think mostly hungry for a run that he feels good about and that's fun for him. He's one that just absolutely thrives off having fun on his board. And he's a goofy foot rider, hopping into this little cool uh, and making really quick work of it, taking some serious pace through, hopping over some rocks at the exit. Yeah, catching control with that heel side edge really, really fast through there for Cody as we've almost always seen him aim for some kind of transfer, something different than the other riders. A big air there, landing into a double. Oh, and he just catches at the edge. So I hope he's okay. He sent that one quite deep, that top section of the double, and then almost landed on rocks at the takeoff of the next. Yeah, you can see from his track that he barely touched down before he was off the next one and just not able to put himself back into balance. I think I think you're spot on there, um, Anna, just a little too far on the first step. And then, yeah, I mean. But as you mentioned, a lot of these rocks that we have here on the Peak de la Planas, they stick out. So you need to really pop to make it over the rock. So I think he might have been juggling catching the transition with clearing the rocks. Yeah, and that's always such a difficult process when you've only done a visual inspection on it. How fast to go. I mean, these, these riders are so expert at kind of figuring those things out. Um, but there, there are a lot of factors in play there. And typically on this face, a little faster is better because you, you want to get over the rocks. But that one had a quite a narrow margin for error. And Cody, unfortunately, just a little too far on that. So just lands immediately before the rocks come at him of the next stage of that double. Yeah, front flipping straight to his back. So the rider's wearing back protectors under their backpacks, the airbag pack with a shovel probe in it, um, providing a, you know an extra layer of protection. So hopefully Cody's all right. He's definitely going to be feeling a little sore from that um, in the very near future. But hopefully he's, uh, he's all good. Definitely not what he was hoping for on that one, but really happy to see that Cody's all right. At least generally, all right. He's standing in the finish area, so that's a good sign. Doesn't look bothered. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'll land on my edge. Sweet, thank you. All right, a 38-3-3 for Cody, giving us a little bit of a heart in the mouth moment as he bounced over. Uh, a, quite a long rock fall there, but managing to clear the rocks, which we're, we're very grateful for, um, and landing in snow. Not super soft snow, but we are straight back to the top to our current tour leader, wearing that golden bib, up, guys? Michael Mon. He had a big win in Bakir Barrett last year, and then things you know settled down a little bit, and then this year, backing that win up with another one with just a fantastic technical run. And Michael Mon now looking to kick things off here in Andorra. He has had a fantastic start to his season. He seems so stoked and excited to ride today. So let's see what line he has planned out. Well, he's got a big task because Ludo, Ludo really had his absolutely stacked, both with features um, and with tricks. It's kind of new for Ludo to, to see the freestyle. So Michael Mon opting for this one on his toe side edge as he's gonna get over onto this corner and make his way onto this one. And nice entrance for Michael Mon. Not too many snowboarders having uh, the ability to get into that one. So that's really a big tick box for Michael. He is the tick master and he has a backside 360 there. Stomp looking super strong on the face. Executed that one so perfectly for Michael Mon. And he's got plenty more to come as he moves into the next feature getting over the rocks, perfect landing. So Michael really bringing the flow to this run. He's got lots of speed and another big 360. Oh, and getting bucked on the landing. That's a tough one, landing fully across the hill. But he's not done yet. He is still picking off features as they come at him. You know, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that for Michael. He, he did have a control issue, but with a couple other riders falling, you can still put yourself into a decent finish. And with only three events before the cut to FWT finals, adding a couple more features after that could be the difference maker between being at the bottom and being in the upper middle, which could be, you know, especially with the first place already under his belt, that's solid strategy for Michael Mon, not giving up and not letting go even when things haven't gone exactly to plan. And I'm not sure if he's been tuning into what's happened previously on Snowboard Men, 
but we've already had two crashes, so perhaps he's aware that he can maybe get higher up if he manages to stack a few more features so close. in. Almost. Dude. Pretty, pretty crushed. Yeah, I didn't know I could get that much speed. So I was like, oh. Oh, I was like, oh, I'm so high up. <laughs> oh, well. Dude, way to go. All right, well, let's take a look at Michael's run. And a big backside three there. Rides out of that one perfectly, but where he has a little trouble is the next one. Yeah, and that one's so nicely stomped. He's always so centered on the board, and then he picked up a bunch of speed, throwing the 360, and yeah, he just, you could see where the terrain shifts from down to gully to up, and he caught the upside mm -hmm. of that the second he landed, and it just tossed him over in kind of a, a loop-de-loop, -loop. but then, as you said, Anna, right back to his feet, adding another feature, so it's, it's gonna be, you know, probably a middle middle score. Um, we'll see where it stacks up with Holden Samuels, who had a similar s significant control issue in an otherwise great run. So judges throwing a 63 on that. So Michael in third yeah, so far uh, with with Ludo Giodia holding down the top spot and, um, and Holden Samuels still sitting in second. As we see the big picture right now, Ludo in first, Holden Samuels right now in second, Michael Mon. So right now second and third, both with significant issues. Plenty of riders now to, to come at the top, who if they can put down a clean run, they're definitely gonna have a, uh, have a say in that podium conversation. And this young man certainly has a chance to do it. We saw him, we saw him at the Nanda backcountry free ride absolutely flying. He's got such a great bag of tricks. But really, even though he's a rookie on the tour, he's a veteran of competitive free ride. He's been doing this for a long time. He's very comfortable in the start gate. He knows how to get his head right, and he is on course. And interestingly, as you mentioned, he's had a really long career on the juniors and the qualifiers. And his dad was telling me he wasn't quite as nervous for his debut on the world tour, which is, you know, mind blowing. Um, and he didn't he didn't have the result he wanted there. He has a lot more in the tank to give us, so I'm excited to see how um, if he's got his head game on point today and if he's putting together something special. Yeah, a little bit of a speed bump in the takeoff, but Liam just handling it, flexing those legs and putting himself straight back into balance as he comes right through the heart of this one and really clean, super fast, committed riding into the fall line. Now Liam well into the run. He's got another big one lined up here as he hops to heel side. Oh, and moving even further across to his next feature, up and over and Liam into the fall line stomps it, is putting together a nice line here with lots of decent ears. Goes front side three and rides out clean. He's looking super solid on snow. Yeah, and I think he found the exact right spot that Michael Mon was looking for on that 360. And now coming over to this lower section, a nice diving board here for the riders, but plenty of action in the landing as you need to dodge all those rocks. So Liam Rivera with a clean run from top to bottom, some solid freestyle in there and really good board handling. I think the judges are gonna like that one. I think the Mexican free ride fans might also. Yeah, as we mentioned before in uh, the last event, Liam, the very first Mexican national rider on the Freeride World Tour. He's holding the weight of Mexico on his shoulders. Uh, and I think the, the country can be proud of that run from this young Freerider as he's getting the cheers in the finish area. All smiles for Liam Rivera. He looks very relieved. Well, Liam has very quickly made himself a favorite amongst the riders and Freeride World Tour staff. He's got a great spirit. He's always fun to be around. Super positive. Let's take a look back at this run, Anna. Yeah, as you said, that was so well handled with the really bucky takeoff there. And this air was absolutely huge and just lands perfectly balanced over his board. Yeah, I love the way he pre-hopped that to make sure he connected with the landing. Another really solid one. And then picking up speed for this cross-court wind drift front three with the grab and landing really clean. That's a tough spot to land in. You can see, I mean, he wasn't as troubled as Michael, but definitely uh, a slight hand down, but then really clean off the bottom. So a great run for the young Mexican free rider as he has wrapped up his campaign here. And that's got to feel uh, a big sense of relief 
to to put one down, you know. Now you start your your free ride world tour career. All right, a 75-6-7. So Liam moving himself into second place, and that's a testament also not just to a great run from Liam, but the strength of Ludo's run. That uh, that a run as good as clean as solid with the freestyle elements as Liam just had is still not pushing Ludo off the hot seat. He's looking pretty comfortable there. So our next rider in the start gate is Jonathan Penfield of the USA. He is a seasoned FWT rider, but he's actually re-qualified himself last year to join us on the tour again. Yeah, John Pow, as they call him, you can catch him riding pillow lines in the coast mountains of BC, living in Squamish. He's got a Verbier title under his belt, which is uh, a, a huge accomplishment for any free rider. And he is another rider, always oh, going over Oh man, on the heel side edge above this exposure to get to this high line. We've only seen one rider over here and he's sitting in the hot seat and Jonathan taking an alternate entrance with such a smooth, clean transition back onto the slope. That was a beautiful way to enter that section. Really strong start to his run and goes big on that one as well. Riding out clean over towards the lookers left. John Pow up on this elevated platform here as he moves down. There's a nice takeoff below him, pointing right off the nose, 360 to perfect landing. Well, Jonathan Penfield, another rider who didn't have a great time or a great result, I should say. Maybe he had a good time in the last event, but now really picking things up as he is looking to take over that hot seat from Ludo, but he's got still a fair section of this face to go. So we saw him go right past that feature that Ludo hit with the backflip, but it has allowed him to get over onto this far rider's right section, and there's plenty of action below him here. So it looks like he's hitting into the chute, taking a big air and straight lining up. Oh, that, that was so clean. That was the only track in that section and pretty much a mandatory air to exit that chute. You could sneak by it, but honestly, if you're in the free ride World Tour comp, why would you? <laughs> He is picking it off and riding his way through into the finished corral. Sick run from Jonathan Penfield. Well, I think now we're going to have some interesting conversation in the judges' tent as that was an extremely strong run from John Powell. Jonathan Penfield definitely making his case. He was fifth in the last event. Look at the exposure here as he takes this one cross court and the connection just so smooth. And then massive backside three there just perfect landing check out the bars there on line fluidity control air and style technique looking super solid and i love that last air in the couloir it's so committed you can't come Good out of the job, fall line Adam. you can't change the angle of your board because you've got that corridor of rocks lining it so any any sort of mistake in angle you're going to pay for it immediately with your face into a rock so jonathan pow backing his or jonathan penfield <laughs> backing his skills there to land in the fall line in that couloir and give himself a shot at the podium as now the judges have it in their hands. Ludo sitting in the hot seat. John Powell, 82 right now. Liam Rivera on the 75, 6, 7, and then everyone below that with significant control issues. So I think this is going to be a tricky conversation with the judges as they go through the criteria and see how they tick them off and really compare the relative, uh, relative merits of those two runs. Yeah, his take on that top cliff was interesting and beautifully executed, but I guess... Ludo's was also bigger the way that he took it, but less fluid. Yeah, and flatter for sure. But mm -hmm. I, I guess if you stomp it, then it doesn't matter. The judges are looking at execution. They're not looking at how uh, how hard you stomp or how how much you compress your spine when you land. But uh, yeah, both of those both of those entrances and both of them having to go above that big exposure. So here we go, 77-3-3 for Jonathan Penfield. So Ludo holding off a big challenge there from John Pow and holding on to the hot seat. John Pow now putting himself into second. Liam Rivera. Moving down to third, Le Ludo just sitting there looking, he's looking pretty comfortable. Pretty chill out there. All right, well, back to the top, another French rider. The French just churning out snowboard pros on the free ride world tour year after year after year. Enzo Nilo, this guy, a another rider who's, he's a rookie, but he's immediately connected with the free ride world tour family, loving having him around. And he is on the face here in Andorra. And he's a regular rider with the 
big bag of tricks and also really good free ride creden credentials. He's got the straight line project um, demonstrating adventures in the French mountains. He's looking for his entrance here. Decided against the little chute that some of the other riders have hopped their way through and is riding over on his heel side edge. Yeah, I think we just need to give credit to that heel side ride across the exposure and how difficult that is. So Enzo now coming through that chute, making short work of it as he gets on the toe side and lining up something below him as he moves towards that little ollie off the tail and nice and clean as he starts to pick up speed. Lining up another hit here. Looking solid. A lot of the snowboard men have caught that cliff. Yeah, stacking things up there. It's nice to see them going back to back to back on these features as he gets this wind drift. And, and then uh, rides down to his next feature. Looking strong. Really keeping things in control here. And so now as he's on the heel side, making sure he's got the trajectory right as there's lots of rocks below and clean and onto the apron for Enzo Nilo as he just lets it go, flying down the bottom section of the face. So a, another strong run, snowboard men. We've had a few bobbles, but overall looking really, really good as we can see the drone shot here just chasing him. The feeling of relief as you come into this flat section for all these tour riders, just palpable as they're, you know, they put so much time and energy into this. And this one's been really compressed time-wise. We were in Spain three days ago, and it was such a rush to move here to get everything set up, but also for the riders to get their heads connected with the fact that we're running an event right now. So let's check out the replay. Looking really solid. Perhaps not as much fluidity as we've seen from some of the snowboard men, but linking together a lot of nice features and always getting the grab. And front side 360 and looking super solid there. Yeah, getting the grab on that one. And then this one, you can see how blind it is from above and all those rocks below. So it's really important riders get their trajectory exactly right. You definitely don't want to be airing your last yeah, feature onto rock. We saw um, last year Kemi Armand on that one with a backflip and then having to ollie over, wheelie over the next set of rocks. So Enzo Nilo now in the finish area. Judges have had their say. He's into fourth with a 72-6-7. So we are going to see for sure Ludo in either first or second, as there is only one rider back at the top of the face, the snowboard field, snowboard men's field, and the complete snowboard field winding down, and it comes down to one. Hans Midnick, another rider who didn't quite have the day he was looking for in the last event, stop number one, and is, is hungry for a, for a strong one. He's such a wizard of the cross-court moves, and this, I, I think this face should really suit his riding style. It's a little bit more open. It's going to allow him to play with the terrain a bit more. Mm, and you can lace those cross-court airs from side to side through that main bowl. He's a goofy foot rider, so should have no issues getting a nice entrance into the face. And even though he didn't have like the result that he might have been looking for in the first event, he just seems so stoked to be here. And... Uh, yeah, just happy to be on the Free Ride World Tour. Yeah, so on his toe side, across the exposure, now just getting eyes on everything below him as he moves right into the meat of this couloir, slashing a couple turns. You can see it's already starting to get a bit bouncy for the riders as he's able to catch the corner of that one and then right onto the heel side edge as he regains control in the exit. He's got solid board control. And he's lining up an air there. And another. And hands, yeah, taking those ones in alternate directions. So showing the, the judges that he's got equal control both on the toe side and the heel side. Looks like he got a little caught up on that one as he now comes heel side into this lower section that's seen a bit of action already. And hands nice and clean off that. All right, so a good upper section for the American wild card as he gets on the heel side now moving across. Over to the lookers left trying to see what features he can find over there. As we mentioned, it's had a little bit more wind effect this side, but the riders who have been over there have been handling it pretty well so far, so feeling yeah. confident. I think there's a there's a, a positive aspect to the, the wind touch 
is it's nice and smooth over there and the wind surface we saw our forerunner Betty Denevo over on that side and it looked kind of creamy and smooth so coming into this lower feature popping a big grab perfect executed landing hands mending now on the heel side getting over slashing towards this lower section there's a bunch of features here that he can choose from so let's see what he will tick off and right off the middle of this one, that landing is flat. But <laughs> hands absolutely handling it. A slight wheelie on the board, but definitely making it look probably better than it felt. Using the full travel of his uh, suspension system there. But a pretty clean run. Yeah, clean run from Hans. I'm sure he's going to be a little bit happier than that than he was in Spain. So he comes in. He's going to kind of check in with Ludo. This is his top cliff there, a little redirection and handles it beautifully. Yeah, there's a big divot in that takeoff. Gets a lot of uh, full full points for Aaron Style. And is riding really well in between features. Takes this one pretty deep, gets the grab. Has made really full use of the face. And takes that one right off the nose a little bit back as he lands and does a little wheelie, but I don't know how the judges will um, score that one. Yeah, he didn't go down or anything. I think that's just a product of how flat that landing was. As mm -hmm. you said, he used all his travel and including the flex of his board um, <laughs> to, to keep himself upright on that. So Ludo with an 82, Hans Midnick looking to, uh, looking to beat that if he wants to take over the top spot. The judges now having their say. Uh, I mean, in the air and style category between those two runs, Ludo had that gigantic backflip. Hans didn't have a huge freestyle <laughs> element or air and style element in his run, so we'll see if they're gonna be able to match that. And I would also say Ludo rode with a lot more fluidity. He was super fast paced out there, so I think he's not bothered in the hot seat. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll let the judges handle that. I, I'm always a little shy to make predictions because we're sitting here and definitely not judges. But Hans <laughs> waiting for the judges to have their say. A strong run and definitely much cleaner than we saw from him in Andorra. So that's a run that he can be proud of. As we wait for the score to come in for Hans Midnick. Anxious moments there. Sometimes the, the riders will be a little chatty in the finish area, other times it's a bit quieter. It's just puffing. It's uh, 450 vertical meters <laughs> to get the legs bearing. Yeah, in. plenty of action there. So fourth there for Hans Midnick with a 73-3-3, which means that Ludo Giodiat is going to win this event. And this is going to be the very first time that Ludo has won a free ride world yeah, tour comp. You can see him hopping out of the dinosaur hot seat. Let's take a look at what happened here in the snowboard men's field as we get a look at our final rankings. Ludo Guillaudiat, the French rider on an 82, taking the win. John Pau in second. And Liam Rivera, the rookie out of Mexico, rounding out the podium in the top three. Incredible action there from snowboard men. Love to see it. We've had a few fireworks, a few crashes. Uh, it's been exciting times. So we just need one more rider for our flower ceremony. Yeah, you can hear the Wranglers in the finish area trying to find John Pau to get him out there for the for the podium presentation as we have a first time winner on the Free Ride World Tour, a longtime competitor, Ludo Guillaudia with the win. John Penfield, Jonathan Penfield bouncing back from a tough result in the last event to put himself on the podium. And the rookie out of Mexico, Liam Rivera, rounding out the top three. That is a spectacular podium. All right, let's take a look at what this does, Anna, to our overall rankings. So Ludo shooting to the top there with a podium in Vaquera Barrett and the win today in Ordino. Michael Morn, even though he had a he had a bubble today, he's still up there in second place with his win in Vaquera Barrett and a, a pretty decent run today. And Jonathan Penfield has made it into third position in our ranking. All right, well, just looking at the way Ludo entered that run, that showed the intention that he carried over through the rest of his run. Spectacular finish for Ludo.
All right, well, snowboard women and snowboard men have wrapped up with fireworks across both categories. We saw 100% stomp rate from the women. We saw a bit of a roller coaster on the men, and we saw a brand new winner for the Freeride World Tour with Ludo Giodia. We are moving on to ski women, and we have a very special guest in the booth with us today. Unfortunate for a bit of a knee injury, but fortunate for us to have you here. Welcome to Lily Bradley. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was uh, really nice to have something to be nervous about this morning. <laughs> I felt like I was a part of the crew. <laughs> excellent, excellent. All right, so we're one event down for the Freeride World Tour. We're going to take a look, Anna, at what our overall picture looks like. So the rookie, Addison Rafford, took out the win in Bikera Barrett, followed by her compatriot rookie, Molly Aranino. Last year's Verbier Extreme winner, Sibyl Blanjon, took third place, and so she's in a pretty comfortable position at this point in the tour. So we're gearing up for stop two. Anything could happen. These riders have got three competitions to make the cut for the Freeride World Tour finals. Yeah, a lot of, lot of hungry riders out there. We'll take a look at the order we're going to drop them in as it's, a, it's always a random bib draw. So we're going to see... The Canadian rider who won in Bakira Barrett last year, Olivia McNeil, is going to be dropping first. Elizabeth Gerritsen second as we move down. Molly Armanino, we saw her with a silver medal already. And then we're wrapping up the category with Justine dufour Lapointe. We saw her come out swinging in Spain. A lot of questions about the transition from moguls into, uh, into free ride. But the questions, a lot of questions answered there. Let's take a look at what you thought at the Peak Performance Fun Bet. So Elizabeth Gerritsen, she got second place here last year in Ordino, and she is at the top of our fun bet for peak performance. Jess Hodder took the win here last year, and you all think she could do again. So she's got some solid points there. And newcomer, Justine defort Lapont, she is she made a big splash in our first event in Bikera Barrette. She threw a big backy, didn't land it, but certainly has caught your attention. All right, so this is a really strong field. Lily, you know, you're sitting here not in the start gate. How does it feel to be, to be watching instead of competing? Obviously, it's tough, but stoked to, to cheer on all the ladies. Oh, super stoked. I definitely feel, like, a lot more nervous watching than I usually would. Like, I feel like a mom. My pulse has been rising this whole time. I'm like, oh, God, what are you doing? That looks dangerous, you know? <laughs> Yeah, maybe talk a little bit about the relationship between the riders. You know, we're always kind of speaking about how, of course, we're, we're, you, you guys are competitors for the time, but the rest of the time, I mean, travel companions, friends, there's a lot going on behind the scenes that we don't really get to see. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Everyone is just like, I don't know, really close friends. You're living in the same room, you know, you're spending pretty much every waking moment together. Uh, so you're competitors, but there's a really, really good vibe between all the athletes. Yeah, the Freeride World Tour family is real. So we're heading up to the start gate. You can see our first rider. She's just going through her mental preparation, Olivia McNeil. Um, there's a lot of solid, solid contenders for the win here. Uh, you know, going through the Peak Performance Fun Bet, I find it impossible to pick. And now with the level of the rookies, I mean, you were a rookie last year coming onto the tour as a brand new rider. How hard is it as a rookie to, to roll in with these... Um, you know, these veterans and the people that you've looked up to sort of through your young competitive life? Oh, it was super trippy. Like, I used to have a poster of Elizabeth Gerritsen in my room, and I was, like, so just flabbergasted to be in the same comp as them. Um, and especially coming from North America, like, we don't really get much visual inspection practice, so I think that that's, like, a big uh, transition for a lot of the rookies from North America. Yeah, I was speaking to Delilah Quinn. I think the Kara Barrett was her second ever visual inspection and she lost her line and I think she learned a lot from it which she's hopefully bringing in to Ordino today so how did you make the transition? Um, I think I tried to do a lot of backcountry like that one year you know just do some visual inspection um, I brought my binos to the resort a couple times and I was just like that kook at the like with binos at the resort um, yeah I don't know I didn't really practice as much as I should to be honest but you seem to make quick work of it getting up to speed with the visual inspection. Yeah, and it feels like this this year's rookies did the same thing as we head back up to the top. Olivia McNeil, 21 years old, a product of the Whistler Freeride Club, and so excited to be here on the tour. Another one saying the same thing last year. She just couldn't believe she was here competing with her heroes. Olivia McNeil dropping in the first of the ski women. 
I've really enjoyed the energy from Olivia. She seems so excited to ski today, and I know that she was uh, planning out some pretty spectacular features, so I'm really excited to see what they are. Yeah, Liv had a bit of a tough run here last year. She was really sick, and so coming into this event, she's feeling like this is redemption day for her. Um, bi yeah, big plans, of course, big plans for all of the riders as she makes her way across this top section. You can see a little bit easier already than it was for the snowboarders, especially the snowboarders who had to come, uh, who had to manage that on their heel side edge. Looking like the snow is a little funky in there, taking it nicely. Yeah, it's definitely tricky, but I think it improves as you get through that top section. And she is lining up a cliff that saw a lot of action from Ski Woman last year and absolutely stomps it. Nice, nice. Yeah, that one's definitely, we saw it last year gobble up a bunch of the ski women who just either didn't pop or didn't pop at the right time. Uh, Olivia never shy to pop, that's for sure. It's be kind of one of her trademarks along with going huge to flat. Um, Olivia McNeil now just looking like she's lining up her first feature and this is a chunky one. Oh. It's huge. <laughs> oh. And oh. has a bit of an explosion that maybe she arrived at the end of the transition there. It looked really difficult to absorb that energy. That was a super big air. She really is like inspecting with her. You just looking at stuff and you're like, you want to hit that? Like that is the biggest cliff on this venue, you psycho. <laughs> Yeah, and I think she just ran out of landing on that one, took it maybe a touch too fast as she's now lining up this lower section off that. And there's another little one avoiding the rocks. All right, so Olivia, still more to come though. Looking really strong despite that bubble off that huge air. Well, that pretty much lived up to uh, the standards of an Olivia McNeil run, a gigantic air, finding the flattest part of the of the transition to land in. I think she just went a little bit too far, but that one looks like it was tough on the legs and back. Uh, Lily, describe how you feel physically after a world tour run. Do you feel beat up, or are you just, in, at this point, crossing the arch, just feeling relief? Oh, like total state of ecstasy. Like when you're in a haunted house, like trapped for a half hour and then you get out and you just get like, <gasps> whoa, like I'm alive. Everything's okay. My body's filled with endorphins. All right, well, inside look at the feeling of crossing through that finish arch. So Olivia McNeil, absolutely massive. Anna, let's take a look at this replay. Yeah, I'm really keen to see that huge long jump that she took. That was it should be the next one, and it's just like a really long section of rock, so I can see why she took so much speed, but definitely arrived at the very bottom of the transition. Yeah, just getting really sat down there. So an unfortunate uh, middle section, but strong top and bottom. We'll see what the judges, I mean, we're gonna call that a significant control issue, but Liv definitely sending it there for the fans as she waits for the score to come in. Lily, the uh, the fluidity and control a little down, I think that kind of checks out. Yeah, she, that was a little bit more than a control issue. All right, so the judge is dropping a 55 for Olivia McNeil. And uh, I guess not quite getting the redemption she was looking for. She hit that air last year uh, with a similar result. Hopefully that's the last time we'll see her hit that one. But uh, knowing Olivia, she's just, she loves it. Those are the exact features that she's drawn to in inspection. And you said it, Lily, when, when you're inspecting with her, you're just like, what? Yeah, dude, like, what are you thinking? Man? Like, I know you can land that, but like, why? Why would you want to? We All right, we go back up. Elizabeth Gerritsen, she is the former Freeride World Tour champion. She's got a Verbier title under her belt. She just oozes style every time she drops out of the start gate. She makes it look like a lot of fun. Such a smooth rider and always with a little bit of a different take on the face, similar um, to, to, I was kind of impressed to see uh, to Addison Rafford. They have a quite a similar skiing style and it's one that I really, really enjoy watching. And she is used to skiing in Verbier where, you, oh, she's getting a bit caught up there, maybe caught a shark. It's a pretty tricky top section, but as I was saying, she's quite well versed with exposure and navigating her way through. She really does have it all as a skier. Just so much competition experience, incredible bag of tricks, gorgeous style, really fast skiing. Oh, I love that. That takeoff, or the, the approach to the takeoff has a huge step in it. And we saw a few of the snowboarders get bucked, but Elizabeth's just handling it, letting her skis pass through as she moves down into these next features. And taking off another air there, lining up her next features. 
There's so much to choose from in this section. Riders really have a wealth of choice. And she is taking on this cliff that saw a lot of action from the snowboard men. A little bit of a backseat landing, but riding out strong. It's so hard in visual inspection to find the spots on this face that have a down sloping landings versus the flat ones because it changes. Every time you move spots, you move positions with the binoculars, it looks a little bit different. So that one may be a little flatter. And Elizabeth getting over onto the other side of this. Oh, oh turning it into a double. That was a sick finish to her line. Oh, nice. That was super creative. Really great use of the venue. Yeah, a lot of questions in face check about that takeoff, if it was going to work, because it looked like it lined up, but again, from different angles, it, it had very different um, looks on whether that takeoff for the first step of the double was going to work. But Elizabeth really clearing up all doubts on that one. It works. Yeah, and the landings on this venue are just notoriously flat, too. Like, you know what you're getting into. It's going to always hurt. <laughs> Well, mostly finding transition throughout that whole run for Elizabeth Gerritsen. A little bit of a sit down on her middle feature, uh, maybe a touch flatter. Anna, run us through this replay. So looking very strong through the top section here. This is the air where she goes pretty deep, way past the other landings, but potentially a bit of a backseat landing. This is a sick feature where she lines up a double, finds the perfect angle to hit that next feature. Thing of beauty. And then a straight line out. I think after Verbier last year, that may be moving towards becoming uh, Elizabeth's signature move. 68-67 for Elizabeth Gerritsen. So she is going to take over the hot seat. Uh, we'll see. I mean, I think the riders are going to be looking for a clean run top to bottom to hold the win today. But a strong campaign there for Elizabeth as her and Olivia Hug compatriots. Uh, as you said, Lily, throughout, uh, throughout the events, you've got these moments where you're competitors, but the rest of the time, everybody's pretty tight. But we go straight back up to the top. There are no breaks in the free ride world tour. Megan Baton, the Chamonix rider, she had a bit of a tough start um, smoking a rock on a, a slight miscalculation on direction and angle in the last event. But Megan going to be looking to come back swinging here in Andorra as she kicks out of the gate and looks for some redemption. Yeah, she's under a little pressure to make this one count. That was a real leg-bending crash that she had in Bikira Barrette, but she's looking strong and coming out hot. Did you see that crash, Lily? How did your knee feel as you saw that? <laughs> Definitely felt a twinge, a sympathy twinge. Indeed. Yeah, Lily, I mean, these two events are so close together. You know, from an athlete's perspective, how hard is it to put yourself back in the mindset when it's only four days after the last event? Oh, I think pretty tough. I know a lot of the athletes have been napping pretty hard over the past couple days. So really smooth entrance into the face there for Megan, making a, finding a sliver of snow that nobody else has passed through, catching the corner of that one and really into things in earnest and turning it into a double, a long double, but really clean so far here. Megan with that ski instructor background so you can see the technique is really solid under her feet. So she's taking a chunk off this cliff that's seen a lot of action. Goes a little smaller, but still gets sat back as Elizabeth did. All right, so up and over the wind lip now. Megan looking to finish with a bang. A few features underneath and another one here. Yeah, that one uh, up top, definitely, I think, flatter than athletes were anticipating. Getting a little caught up in the wind drift, but coming over to this lower diving board and taking that an angle that may give her, oh, yeah, clean exit. Lots of rocks in there. you got to be so quick on your feet, Lily, to manage that last section. Yeah, it looked like she nailed that landing pretty well, got out of those rocks really quickly. That was a good use of that. So definitely a better run than she had in Bikera Barret. I think the rookie will be pretty happy with that one. Yeah, feels good to just put something down on your feet, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, you know, Lily, you actually had a similar entrance into the Freeride World Tour last year with your very first event in Bikera Barret not going exactly as planned. And so, you know, coming back to, to the second event when you've got maybe a little bit more pressure, is do you feel the pressure or are you just looking to do the one run and then the rest of it takes care of itself? I think if you have a, you know, kind of a tough first event, it's not so much of a pressure, more of like a hunger, you know? You wanna do well for you, you know you can do well, you know you can send. So more of a hunger than a pressure. Oh, I like that take on it. So you saw that double here. Megan taking a different takeoff than Elizabeth did, but still finding that one just to be a bit much for the, for the legs. 
controlling her speed to get the right direction and just expertly navigating the rocks in the landing of that last hit. So, so far in the ski women's category, we've seen some serious control issues and Megan Baton dropping in with a 58. So the riders definitely going to be looking, the riders behind these ones, going to be looking to clean things up. Still plenty of opportunity to put a big score on the table if the scoping went well, if things are a little smoother than, uh, than we've seen so far. Right back up, we've got Addison Rafford, first year on the tour. She's only 21 years old and she's already got a win to her name. What a great way to start. I mean, she's got to just be overflowing with confidence right now, knowing that visual inspection is actually something she can do. Yeah, an incredible debut for this rookie on the world tour. I think she's having fun and uh, is getting used to the new format. Well, and the other women were describing her in the start gate, saying she was just cool as a cucumber, ready to have fun. And, you know, it's it's a great thing to latch onto if you can. I mean, the start gate nerves, Lily, that's pretty real. Yeah, she's got this, like, very mega chill energy. Just seems She just seems totally unfazed by everything. Again, no stranger to competition. I think, oh, oh, going down there. I mean, this is a really tricky section. That's disappointing to see for her. Hopefully she's okay. Oh, gosh, right at the top of the run, too. That's a really tough spot. So she's lost a pole, but we've got multiple ski ninjas out on the face that can help her out with that. So looking like she's just going to step out of the way and we'll, uh, we'll probably lean on our... Ski Ninjas to come and get her pole out of the way as it's probably in the line of some other riders that are going to be looking to come through there. That's a tough one for Addie Rafford. Uh, looking like she just got a little caught up. I think there's some concavities in that in that entrance and, and maybe just dug a tip in or something. We saw a, a similar issue, not obviously with the same result. We can take a look here, Anna, maybe. Yeah, it's definitely seen a lot of traffic. It might have just been some funky s snow. It's turning into a mogul field out there. Yeah, it looked like she just lost the downhill ski, and as soon as you're not standing on that ski, that's the one that provides you with essentially all your grip onto the mountain, and once the downhill ski gets bucked out from under you, there's not much holding you up. So Addie Rafford, I think we're, uh, she's sidestepping up. Oh, but in a, in a very conscientious move, she's staying close to the rocks to sidestep up so she doesn't affect the snow surface for the other riders. So that's a real team move from Addie, knowing that there's, there's still a ton of other riders up at the start gate and not wanting to mess up the snow conditions for her. Um, when you're in this position, that's got to be just so disheartening to have to hike back up. Uh, yeah, I always feel just like so embarrassed to not be hiking fast enough, you know, like, oh God, everyone's waiting for me, what do I do? <laughs> And the legs are burning. Yeah, legs are burning. You're working your hardest. You know everyone's watching you. Oh, that choke is like so small and all the athletes have to come through it. That thing's gonna get totally hammered today. Yeah, it's gonna get harder and harder to get through there clean for sure. And Addie Rafford kinda kinda giving giving a bit of credence to that as she's found herself unfortunately coming unstuck, but with only three events before the cut. Having a win under your belt, Addie's not going to go too far down the rankings. This one's going to be a write-off, and, and you, you kind of said it, Lily. She's got that chill energy. I, I don't think this is going to go, you know, go too deep into her head coming into the next event. Yeah, she was in a good position to start with, and she's just such a big chiller. I don't think she's going to be super phased by this hiccup. All right, well, Addie now back on track as she's collected her pole. That's going to be a fairly serious fluidity dock, I'd say, having to go back uphill to get the pole and now just enjoying a nice smooth run but we get to enjoy that effortless ski style that Addie has. I think it's yeah hella steez, I think is what you'd call it. Hella steez. Arms up and the snow is starting to look pretty nice as you know we've, we've seen the more south facing side on the lookers right riders left definitely had a big sun effect from from yesterday you can see those roller balls from the melt and now Addie Raffer just making her way off the face, wrapping up her day. That's a tough one. You know, I, I think we got to really give credit to the fact that we were so compressed from the last event to this event. Hard for riders, you know, both like the elation that Addie was feeling and maybe some of the, the less comfortable feelings that the riders who didn't do as well. It's not much time to reset. And, and for a lot of that, there was a lot of rushing, having to get here from Spain, rush up the face to do face check, to get yourself set, and then actually feel good about your line and then 
you know, it, it's not a lot of time. And also in terms of rest, yesterday they've been hiking for hours to come to face check. So it's... Yeah, I mean, Lily, you said the, the naps have really been kicking off in these last couple of days for these athletes. Oh, yeah, naps on naps on naps, lots of resting. I've been saying they should send, like, a tour therapist to just come with us to every event. We can go chat with them. Yeah, a lot of feelings. A lot of feelings uh, across the board from riders and staff. A huge credit to the staff for getting this whole thing set up in two days. But we are continuing on. Sibylle Blanjean winning in Verbier at the end of last season, coming into this season with a ton of confidence. She's another one who's really picked up the uh, strength and conditioning training, and we saw it pay off big time in the first event in Spain. We're going to see if she can continue this streak. Two podiums in a row for the Verbier rider, looking to uh, get things going and keep that rolling. The Sibyl really, she's not nearly as nervous today as she was before the first event. Yeah, I think you can see her maturing in her line choice and the way that she's able to rip a line. Like she chose the best note on the mountain in the first stop and just absolutely slayed. All right, well, putting herself above this exposure. Yeah, you said it, Lily. This is, this is seeing a lot of action and it's going to get tougher and tougher. So the riders are going to have to be on point with their technique as they move through this choke. Yeah, Sabile's pretty comfy with like good steep terrain, though, coming from Verbier. Absolutely, she's out there sending it in the cool was on the downtime, either side of the free ride world tour, lining up her first hit, gets the grab in there and continues over towards the looker's left. Oh, looks like she's going into this classic hit all the riders have been favoring today. Nice, nice. A uh, nice clean landing there for Sabil. So one out of three so far on that one. So testament to the squats she's been doing and all that uh, all that work. And the speed, we saw that with Erica too, having enough speed to turn that roller into a little air feature. That's a great way to catch the judge's attention. It just shows the speed. Fluidity is a category and it matters. Oh, nice little shifty in there. Great style. Working her way over to the looker's left. The snow's a little funky, but she is looking. You can see her skis moving, but she is handling it with those strong legs. I know watching the forerunner come through there this morning, just with a collective groan from the athletes, seeing what the conditions were like. And a big one stomps it. That was a sick way to finish a great run from Sibyl Flangeon. Yeah, the judges describing the way they're looking at it as a thermometer, temperatures going up, temperatures coming down. So finishing with a strong air like that is going to bring the thermometer up into a place where the score, you know, the numbers will reflect it. It's uh, strategically, but also kind of, you know, from, from a rider's view of feeling it, it's got to feel good to finish with a bang like that with a, with a big feature at the bottom. I know, I was talking to her this morning, and I was like, so, dude, do you have, like, another fatty lined up? And she was like, no, no, no fatty today. <laughs> Total liar. <laughs> Yeah, keeping it close to the close to the chest there, Sabil. That was a really strong way to finish. A good entry at the top. We saw a similar feature uh, that Elizabeth catching the grab there. So nice and clean for Sabil. Um, and I think the judges are going to like that. This one we'll see. Handled the landing better than uh, the two previous riders, and then just stacked in a bunch of features. Is she the only one to not backslap that yet? So far, yeah. She's the only one to get it clean. And then I really like this angle. Connecting with the snow, uh, finding that tree is a great uh, visual cue for where to go. I mean, how hard is it on a face like this where it's all rock to, to find those, those landmarks? Oh, pretty difficult for North Americans. Probably not for them. All right, so Sibyl sliding her way into second there with a 62. So Elizabeth Gerritsen holding on to the hot seat with her Swiss and Verbier compatriots, Sibyl Blanjean sliding into second position. Interesting times here in the ski women's field. We saw a clean run from Sibyl, but I think the bottom section of Elizabeth's line may be a little bit stronger uh, and possibly a bit more direct. And the judges taking all that into account through all their criteria and all those factors matter. So you can see the start gate there, the other riders stacking up, and we go right back up to Molly Armanino. One comp, one podium, 29 years old. Uh, friends on the qualifier tour said she had a bunch of years where she would just explode every single run, and then last year started to put it together and really working out for her as she rolled onto the free ride world tour with a bang in a second place. Couldn't wish for a better start to the 
free ride world tour season as a rookie. So she's just working her way through this little tech shoot that a few of the snowboard men came through and also straight lining like an <gasps> oh, holding it just together. Holy smokes. Oh, Jesus, that was stressful. Way <laughs> to keep it together. We all caught our breath there. If you follow Molly Armanino on Instagram, she is no stranger to big committed straight lines. And so that suited her style perfectly, but definitely, as Lily said, a stressful moment watching her come out, taking this one off the corner. That was a great nice. uh, line on that cliff because it's seen so much traffic and she found a clean landing with a good steep transition or steep air transition. I think way better on that corner than mm -hmm. it was in the middle of that cliff and Molly because it didn't even look like she had to go very deep into her legs to hold that landing. I mean, also, she's extremely strong, so that helps. But so far, a really good start for Molly Armanino as we see her coming into the sneaky cliff that Sybil Blanchon was the first one through. Yeah, she's such a G at visual inspection too. Like she's just a backcountry legend. She's so used to this kind of thing. And taking this cliff that again requires a massive straight line out the bottom with real pace, a sick line from Molly Armanino. I really like that airplane turn off the air to set her up into the cool wire. We spoke about it a bit with John Penfield. You can't miss your angle on that landing or you're going face first into the rock wall, uh, which I, I'm pretty sure is not something the riders are aiming to do but molly making that absolutely look easy and you can be guaranteed sitting on your couch at home that that was not easy uh lily molly's line choice is so far in two stops on the world tour super creative and always different from what we see from the other women yeah she oh god <laughs> i don't ever want to watch that again yeah, I don't know. She just like uh, I think she's just a so much backcountry. Um, she's really has like an eye for unique lines. Um, really good at visual inspection, and she also kind of just changes her line like five times every competition. Where every time you talk to her, she's like, "Okay, what do you think about this cliff? This cliff? This cliff?" And you're like, "All right, just pick pick one, man. <laughs> just pick something." Well, I like the way she did that. She's got to be feeling uh, feeling the nerves jangling after that entrance into the run, but didn't let it affect her at all. So Elizabeth Gerritsen sitting on a 68-67 with a significant control issue on the backslap on the landing. Molly making that one look perfect. Um, we'll see what the judges have to say about that little wobbly exit on the straight line. She didn't go down. There was no issue, but it definitely all got all of us uh, breathing a little harder there. All right, score coming in a 76-7 and Molly Armanino into the hot seat. That's two comps in a row where she has put herself into the mix for the win. A 76-7 and a big run for the young American rookie, Molly Armanino taking a breath last week or at the last event in Spain. She looked really uncomfortable in the hot seat, almost as if she couldn't believe it. All right, so here's where we sit. Molly Armanino, Elizabeth Gerritsen, Sibyl Blanchon. Those are your top three so far in the ski women, but we are not done. We are going to go back up to the start gate. We've got news that Delilah Quinn is not going to be taking the start. She's got a real big back issue that's just kicked up in the last couple of days, so unfortunately not able to go. So we have Freeride World Tour champion, reigning champion Jess Hodder, a, another one looking for redemption after a tough day in Spain. And also our winner from uh, Ordino last year. So she knows the space. She linked some beautiful features last year. She's in a good headspace today, so I'm so stoked to see her ride. She's working her way into this really tricky couloir that's caught a couple of skiers, some funky transitions. Sure. Hopping off the side of that one and making it work. She is lining up a cliff that she hit last year with incredible stees. Again, stomps it clean and rides out towards the lookers left of the face. Jess Hodder is lining up a really nice line here. Oh, you can just see how, like, how flat that landing is by what her body did there. But she just handled it. And another one clean. She is looking good. Snow is flying up a little bit as she's riding. Gets the Japan Ooh. grab in. Styling. So Jess Hodder, she has said vocally she really likes this face. She feels like it's a much better fit for her ski style. Catching off a different direction. Air oh! oh! And a huge punch front for Jess there. I'm, oh. 
hope she's okay. She's she's waving at us, giving us a signal that she's okay. But that was a heavy fall, just straight over the bars. Wonder if she caught something in the landing. It was just two forwards. Well, oh. have a look at the bomb hole there. You can see the difference between her track and the track slightly to the looker's left. It looks a little bit more of a wind deposit there, and she punched right through it, and her feet just came to a dead stop. Yeah, that was super lucky that she didn't go into that rock at the bottom. That would have sucked. And she was at breakfast, she was kind of planning the angle to get really close into that rock buttress there just to ensure her next hit, but maybe not the perfect landing. It looks like the snow's pretty hard to read though, you know? Like all of like the wind deposits are gonna look the exact same as thing like something with a shallow landing. Mm. Yeah, so that's that's one of the real challenges, especially on a face like this where you have different exposures and the wind has been transporting snow. Is there a way, Lily, during inspection, during face check, that you feel like you can kind of lock in on that or is it just truly a, a, a gamble? I feel like you're just like praying that the forerunner is going to like go ski near your landing, you know, and then otherwise you're kind of just gambling with it. Well, the gamble definitely coming up short there for Jess Hodder as the rest of the run was so strong. And then you can see even where she's hiking, it's quite punchy. There's a bit of a wind press uh, layer on the top and then the snow underneath that wind press layer is really soft. So it looks like horrible hiking conditions. Yeah, really feeling for her right now. Didn't have the results she wanted in Vicara Barrett. She's under pressure to make that cut. And she was looking so good until the snow unstuck her landing. Yeah, she's going to be pretty bummed. If anything, maybe she'll get another good uh, viral crash video out of it. That could be something. Mm, yeah, she certainly had the most spectacular crashes of 2022 that kind of broke the internet. And this year, she was pretty determined to look after her body more by having more consistent riding. And so far, those plans have gone slightly awry. Well, the rest of that run was just so good. It was looking like classic Jess Hodder. You know, she's got such a unique style. And you can, you can watch her from half a kilometer away from another ridge and know immediately that it's Jess. I, I really like the way she skis. Um, she's been doing a lot of filming over, she's moved herself from, from New Zealand for the winter, or for the northern winter, to Pemberton, just up the road from Whistler in Canada, doing a lot of filming, spending a lot of time in the backcountry, uh, learning how to snowmobile, which is a, a big task. Um, but Jess Hodder definitely putting 90% of a spectacular run together there. And then unfortunately the snow conditions, as Lily said, it's a bit of a gamble, a roll of the dice, and you never quite know until your feet touch the ground. Yeah, I was living like uh, in New Zealand over the summer near her and it was just so fun to ski around. She is really just such an incredibly intelligent, cool person, such a strong skier, really, really fun person to spend time with. Well, Jess is going to make her way through the finish arch. That one is not going to push Molly Armanino off the hot seat. So Molly right now guaranteed to be on the podium as she is sitting in first with only one rider left at the top. So this, uh, this young American rookie definitely making a splash on the Free Ride World Tour. Big hugs for the girls. We'll see if we can catch the convo. Well, we go back up for our last rider in the ski women's field, Justine dufour Lapointe. She is a, a basically a rock star in Canada. She's got two Olympic medals, one gold, one silver from moguls, transitioning via a wild card into the Free Ride World Tour this year. There were a lot of questions about what that transition would look like. A lot of those questions answered in Bakira Barrett. The backflip didn't work out, but watching her cliff stomp and then the skiing in the couloir after, Justine is here to play. Her skiing always aggressive. It's kind of a trademark of her skiing. High speed, high risk, and very exciting to watch. Justine on course. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure to see her embrace the Freeride World Tour and a new code and just bring a full skill set to the board. That was such like a cool first move to just like right off the bat, throw a huge backy in like a high exposure zone. So sick. All right, so navigating this little bump, big pop there, catching a little safety grab, starting things off. That bump definitely we've seen a few riders while well, we saw Addison get rocked by that. Now coming down to this heart cliff, picking it up with a little pre-pop, nice and clean on the land. A good start here for Justine. 
We saw a lot of issues with ski women on that cliff last year, and it's great to see them all just sailing over it. No worries this year. Yeah, popping slightly early. I think a lot of them watched the videos from last season and saw the way it was taken. Same angle as Molly. Nice, clean landing. All right, so Justine well and truly into things here, catching the wind lip, flying across, and able to handle it. That's a very strange transition from down to back up again. And now Justine over on this uh, rider's left side of the face. Looking for one of these features here. There's lots to choose from. Taking it. Strong stomp. I feel like you'd never be able to tell that she was a mogul skier. She's got like such a new school style. It's not, I don't know, not very structured. Yeah, I agree. It's It doesn't look like mogul skier style, but it does look super solid over the feet. She never kind of looks like she's out of balance. She's another one who takes her strength and conditioning very seriously. I mean, after 10 years on the World Cup of moguls, you, you're going to imagine she's pretty strong and nice and clean into the finish. A clean run for Justine dufour lepoin So let's check out her navigation of that really variable and mogully cool wire. This is the heart cliff, which she executes perfectly, riding out strong, beautiful ski technique, and just chooses a great takeoff and landing zone for this and lands perfectly. Yeah, her and Molly unlocked this, the Da Vinci code on that one and found the right angle and then nice and clean at the top as you see Sibyl and Elizabeth just watching anxiously the two Swiss riders, their good friends, travel buddies and ski partners back home. So you can see the line tracker, nice, fluid, smooth Hello. fall line. <laughs> and the score coming in and Justine dufour Lepon is into first with a 74. The look on her face says it all. The last rider down the face and pushing Molly Armanino off the hot seat. So let's say, fair to say, that Justine is here to play. We're going to take a look at the overall picture here from today's event here in Ordino Arcalis. Canadian rider Justine dufour Lapointe taking the win. Molly Armanino, rookie, now two silver medals to her name. And Elizabeth Gerritsen coming back from her fourth place in the last event into third. Sibyl, another strong result for the Swiss rider. So a couple Swiss flags high up there on the ranking sheet. Megan Baton fifth and Olivia McNeil in sixth. What a show. Ski women, every single time they drop in, we get fireworks. And here we see our three podium finishers. Incredible lines there. And uh, serious, seriously big skills thrown down on the face and some challenging conditions. So let's check out how today's results have shaken up the rankings. Molly Armanino is up there in first position with two second places so far. Justine dufour Lapointe, she bumps her way into second. And Addison Rafford, despite today's uh, throwaway score, is still right up there in third place. We've got the two Swiss riders tied for fourth, so they will be battling out all in the right. next event. Well, what a great run for Justine dufour Lapont after a tough crash, but as Lily said, an incredible entrance onto the Freeride World Tour, taking the win here in Spain. Yeah, that seemed like the result that she was looking for. All right, well, we are back. We are three categories down and one to go. 
The Free Ride World Tour here in Ordino Arcalis delivering everything. It was a quick transition, but we are on, and the face and the riders delivering everything. Here's where we sit in the overall so far in Ski Men. So Max Palm backed up his win in Bikera Ray to lead the ranking. He actually had a crash on this face last year, so let's see how he handles it. Our season wildcard Oscar Mandan made a perfect debut in second place in the rankings, and Carl Regner Eriksson always up there. He's in third position. Yeah, when uh, Mark and I were chatting in the season lead up in the Freeride World Tour podcast, we both had, well, we, we put a lot of chips on, on the Carl card. It feels like he's kind of in his ascendancy, the year of Carl maybe coming and uh, definitely putting himself in a good spot. You know, for Carl, it's not just event results right now. He's looking at the big picture and he wants to put himself on the top of the podium for the overall after the Extreme Verbier. So we're gonna take, uh, well, we're gonna see if he's able to do that. Let's have a look at how things are gonna kick off today. We have, of course, fireworks to start. Abel Moga and Ross Tester, the first two men out of the gate, looking for a massive Superman front flip for Abel. And then we make our way down, Christopher Turdell in fifth, and then young Marcus Gogan, after the win on uh, at the Freeride Junior World Championships, was granted a wild card once Imar Navarro retired. We make our way down and just a stacked field. Ralph Velpener, the freestyle wizard, is going to be looking to kind of step things up after Spain. Maxime Chablot, the current world champion, starting just after Max Palm. So the Max battle really starting to heat things up here. And then we're going to close it off with the man who had the line of the day and the peak performance radical moment in Spain, Leif Muma. So we'll see who you think is going to take things out here in the peak performance fun bet. So we've got Max Palm maxed out there in the top voting position, and then the world champion Maxime Chablot with 51%, and of course, Captain Consistent Karl Regner Eriksson with 39% of you voting for him as a big threat today. Yeah, you can never count out a single rider on this start list, and I know we say this over and over, but through every single category, Every rider could win one of these events, depending on how their headspace is, the execution, their line selection. I mean, we saw it with Jess. She was on her way to probably, a, or at least potentially, a winning run and then coming undone. How much did, does that factor in, Lily, when, when you guys are talking to each other? I mean, are there favorites or are you kind of aware or feel how even the field is? Um, I feel like you kind of know that it's anyone's game. It's just about choosing a line that you think is going to be the winning run. Um, anyone has the ability to win it, but it's all kind of just up to your line. When you're when you're selecting lines, do you do a lot of comparisons with other riders, or are you just really focused on your own program? Um, I think that you know everyone's kind of looking at what other people are doing. Like, oh, what clip are you hitting? Oh, you're doing that one? Sheesh, dude. Okay, I guess I got to hit that one too. Um, but for the most part, I really do think that like picking out your line is just every athlete kind of feels a line that like calls to them, you know, is I think, you know, the phrase that is commonly used. You're just kind of waiting for something to call to you. Um, and then that's probably going to be the best. It's the gut feeling. Well, everyone seems to have a pretty unique skill set. And so I guess different features and lines speak to different athletes. And I mean, that's good watching for everyone at home as well, because we don't want to see everyone train the same line and see who can do it best. We want to see a variety. Yeah, and this face so far really delivering on that. We've seen success on, on multiple different sides. We've seen people over on the way riders left and, and Katie Anderson going far, far riders right and taking the win. Um, and I'm sure we're going to see a huge diversity in line selection in the ski men as well. Definitely chatting to the riders during face check. There was they're, they're scattered all over the place, and in, in some of them looking for trick errors, some of them looking for the biggest thing they can land in these snow conditions, um, and some of them just looking at some absurd things that don't even make sense. But that's why all these riders on the free ride world tour across all categories are our heroes, the superheroes of free ride. The last category to drop is Ski Man. You can see this start gate picture gives you a real sense of the exposure. Immediately out of the gate is completely convex and right down towards just a maze, a labyrinth of rocks. How scary is it standing up there, Lily? Um, it's a little bit sketch uh, standing at the top of that just because you know, like standing at the top, you're like, oh, if I fall there, I'm probably not going to be okay, am I? You can really see that. Yeah, hopefully not too much if I fall uh, going through the riders' heads right now. Each of the riders has their own start gate routine that they go through to put themselves into 
performance mode, and everybody's got a totally different way of getting there. This man, I can't even imagine what he does in his own head as he continues to deliver highlight reel moments, run after run, immediately a fan and rider favorite, Abel Moga, the Spanish rider. The, the welcome he got into the finish area in Spain was nothing short of spectacular, and he is the first rider out of the gate for ski men. The crowd reaction definitely shook the ground in Vaquera Barrett after his Superman front flip. He's got himself into a pretty technical entrance there and is just handling it with, oh, and going down. I think I spoke too soon there. Oh, stop. Oh my God. Holy, Abel Moga trying to self arrest, getting himself onto his feet at the takeoff. He's straight back up. He looks like he can't believe it. Yeah, that's the international sign for I'm okay. Um, he has just been for an absolute ride. That was like the best possible way he probably could have handled that though. That was a really gnarly spot to fall. Yeah, and you could see him trying to self arrest, but he did get himself back to his feet right before the lip of that last one that he just sailed off. Abel Moga, well, we, we were expecting fireworks. We weren't expecting that brand of fireworks from Abel. That was a, uh, that was a wild start. The, that entry couloir had no room to, to shed speed at all. So he just went from zero to 100 immediately, which is, you know, Abel's trademark. Uh, but that one just not quite able to hold on. I think the snow conditions, they're, they're, it seems like they're running pretty fast. And we mentioned that the average gradient of the face is 37, but I think the section that he just came through would be pushing 45, 50. It's a really steep zone. It's seen the sun, it's firmed up. And it was really tricky to handle. So let's hope he's feeling okay. I can't imagine what goes through his head when he's like picking out a line. You know, he's just like, I will choose the biggest thing. <laughs> All right, so let's have a look here. Abel picking up a ton of speed, and then he tries to wash it off, but it just kicks him straight off that one. And there's a moment here where it looks like he's going to be able to stop himself. That comes right over that cliff with skis under him, which oh is exceptional. Oh, my God. But it looks like he might have clipped that second stage with his hip, perhaps. So I hope he's okay. Yeah, hopefully with his feet there for Abel Moga. That was cat-like that he managed to get his feet under him at the exact moment he needed to. Not sure if he caught the rock. I mean, as we said, the rider's wearing a back protector. The backpack's got a shovel and probe in it. So there are a few layers of protection, but... Whew. Do you remember the uh, Abel Moga fan club song they sing? Abel Moga, oh, oh, oh Abel Moga. <laughs> well, he'll be singing that one in Spain. So that's going to be a no score for Abel. Abel, you good, man? Yeah. But, no, he's so heavy, dude. Yeah, so rough. All right, so we're getting a little bit of an insight there from Abel finish line chat that the snow definitely <laughs> catching some sun at the top and starting to get a little bit heavy. As, uh, as you mentioned, Anna, in the face preview, we've got a couple different angles of the face and the stuff that's facing more south is picking up more sun. And as we move through the day, it's gonna affect it a lot. And we saw it with the ski women in that lower choke. It's starting to get a little rough. And for Abel there, just not able to get the skis, the edges dug in without getting tossed into those side flips. Luckily able to uh, to wrangle himself into a position to take off on the, uh, on the lower one. Um, Snow conditions are definitely going to come into come into play here. Yeah, from from yesterday we saw that uh, the lookers right section, which is a little more south facing, was getting some natural roller balls through, indicating it's heating up and just releasing a bit of snow there. So I think he said it was heavy, so I think it could be getting quite warm out there. Yeah, heavy and flat. That's like everyone knows that's not the best stomping it's conditions. A sticky combination. So the judges, uh, you know, one thing that they kind of hit hard is they're not going to penalize riders for moving slowly and in a controlled manner through this top section because they want riders to be able to get through that uh, upright and intact. So the, the high-speed approach through there, as we saw from Abomoga, is a tough one to control. Um, it is... I got to say, the trademark calling card of Abel Moga is high speed through sections that don't make sense for a lot of speed. But Abel, you can see all smiles at the finish. So he's, uh, he's going to be all right, probably a little sore, but we've got a nice long break before kicking horse. So he's going to have time to let those bruises heal up and uh, get himself 
in in a good mindset to go again when we start the next event. Yeah, he's not like a strategy guy. He's a huck and pray kind of guy. It typically works out. He's incredibly strong. Yeah, he's strong enough for it yeah. to work. Well, you can hear the mics picking up the next man in the gate. Always a podium threat, this rider. Ross Tester, we have seen we saw him win the very first event that he ever set foot on the Freeride World Tour. He is also a former Freeride Junior World Champion. We've got three of them in the field today, which is, uh, four of them, sorry, I should say, in the field today. Uh, and that proving to be a really strong stepping stone for riders coming onto the Freeride World Tour. Ross Tester, kind of the... Um, the perfect, if you if you had to build a free rider in a shop, it's exactly what you've built. Great technique, a bit of reckless abandon when it comes to airs, and a deep, deep bag of freestyle tricks. He's got all of it. Uh, Ross Tester having a, a bit of a rough run with the Sharks, um, the Spanish Sharks in Bacara Barret. So he's going to be looking to come back swinging as uh, shins are a little bit sore from, from the last event. But definitely you cannot ever count Ross Tester out in a free ride World Tour event. He got sharked in Bakira two years in a row. That was just plain unlucky. Yeah, we had a bit of a uh, funny combination of a low base and then a bunch of new light fluffy snow that came. So it did a great job of hiding the rocks, uh, but not such a good job of covering them. The base here in Ordino Arcalis, much more consistent, much more predictable. So the riders are, are really enjoying that. And, and also having sort of a, a solid understanding or, or, or um, confidence that there's snow right up to the edges of the takeoff. So it gives the riders a lot of confidence coming through that they know their takeoffs are going to work. It's not a, it's not a guess and a, and a hope. Damn drone. All right, again, 30 seconds for Ross Tester. Yeah, Ross. All right, picking up on the start yeah, gate mic that we are 30 seconds here. away yeah. from Ross Tester, the second rider in the ski men's field. All smiles in the start gate. He absolutely thrives on this. Getting himself psyched up to drop in. It's always a lot of pressure when someone has just crashed before you. All right, well, Ross Tester had a great preseason in Utah skiing powder. And now we're going to see what he's got to say here on the Peak to the Plana. Dealing with some Pyrenees shin bang, but riding in strong and looking like that is absolutely no issue. He's in a pretty consequential zone here, so how is he going to take it? A little hop and a 360 off of that one, and perfect landing. So Ross Tester getting things started as we expected in a classic Ross Tester way, coming in on the side angle on this one with a backflip. Dude, so smooth. He's just so smooth, man. That was incredible form from Ross Tester, and he is just racing through the middle of the face there, finding his next feature. He's got this big step up with a three, making the transition perfectly. Ross Tester putting a stamp on this Ordino Arcalis face. Another cross-court move here as he finds the sneaky entrance into this lower section. Ross Tester blowing it away here, the second man out of the gate, and it is going to be hard to beat this one if Ross is able to keep it together all the way down. It's like he's physically incapable of straight airing. Like he just has to do some stuff. Taking a lot of speed cross court there and riding out. What an incredible run. Jam packed features, freestyle tricks, rock solid skiing. Yeah, that big turn he made in the open face to get himself onto that step up with the, uh, with the 360. And the crowd absolutely loving it here in Andorra as Ross, same as last year, bouncing back from a tough start to, to the season with an absolutely spectacular entrance into this day. Abel Moga going down, big hug between these two riders as Abel having a tough one, but Ross really coming back swinging. So that huge 360 went super long on that one. And a massive backflip, perfect stomp, just looks so relaxed in the air and on snow. He really is such a technical skier with just like the most playful style. Yeah, I mean, I said before, it's the perfect combination for this sport. He's got that looseness, but also when he's skiing, it just never looks like he's putting a foot out of place. And then every single feature, incapable of a straight air in the words of Lily Bradley. Such a great run. 
Well, a 90-point run for the second rider in a 23-man field. The judges are feeling that. The crowd is feeling it. We're feeling it here in the booth. And even the other riders just absolutely floored by that. Ross Tester bringing the Ross Tester vibe here to the Freeride World Tour in Ordino Arcalis. What a way to get things going. And really, I mean... Lily, when you're in the start gate and you watch a rider fall in front of you and then you're next, what does that do to your headspace? Oh, yeah. Just, like, getting back from that is such a mental game. Yeah, Ross really had to, like, overcome a big one there. That was really solid. Well, he seems rather pleased with that one. A huge grin as he takes his spot in the hot seat, and he may be there for a while. Well, we get the full picture of the face here in Ordino Arcalis as we move back up to the start gate, perch precariously up there. The rider's not a lot of room to hang out, to get yourself into your uh, into your performance zone as all the other ski men just witnessed. I'm not sure how much of it they could see from the top, but they could definitely hear the crowd roaring as Ross made his way down. Maybe they could see that upper 360, but it's pretty blind. It's very convex at the top. So uh, it's a bit of a lonely time in the start gate while, while you wait and, and hope for the other riders. And then you can just see the finish arch. You see them pop through there in what seems like a good amount of time, gives you a bit of an idea, but hard to know the specifics of it. Mm. Lily, you've been up in that start gate before. What, what visuals do you have from up there? Um, usually, well, last year they let us kind of walk down onto the ridge. There's this, like, grassy ridge we could walk down onto and get a good view of the whole area. Um, but it's pretty blind from the start gate. Okay. Right back up to the top, Oscar Mandan, rookie wildcard. He's been a mainstay on the Challenger Tour, on the qualifiers, but he made a big splash in his entrance to the Freeride World Tour, getting himself into second place in his very first competition. French rider Oscar Mandan kicking things off here. Yeah, he's realized his dream by coming through on a season wild card and to land in second place in the first event was another dream come true for Oscar. He's getting himself into this spicy entrance that we just saw some play on and going pretty long on that one, looking solid. Now Oscar coming down, we can see the tracks from previous riders, a big backflip. A bit Whoa. of a wheelie out, and Oscar getting bucked there, managing to stop himself. A great, great self-arrest there. Oscar Mandin riding in the French Alps. You know he's no stranger to big terrain, and that was a veteran move from that rookie. Yeah, as mentioned, he's already got a podium under his belt. He's just putting in another 360 there just to bump up that line score. Just for funsies. I think yeah. it's just for funsies, you know. But also just to bump your, your score up, even though you've had a little control issue. Nice double there out the bottom. Lily, when, you, when, when you're riding and you have a bobble, is there a thought, well, we've talked about this in the booth, is there ever a thought of, of strategy of trying to take a, a crash run and turn it into a mid-pack run, or are you just finishing things off for fun? Oscar off this big air to flat and handling that one too. Is that something that you think about after a bobble like that, or do you, are you, is it purely just for fun? Um, I feel like you're thinking to yourself, like, you know that it's not going to be one of the highest scoring lines, so you might as well ski the line you wanted to ski and just prove to yourself that you want, you could do it. Mm, yeah, I like that aspect of it, just the rider wanting to do it for themselves. That's what everybody's here to, to, to do. You know, so many riders talk about a, a run they're proud of versus, you know, or when they're not. And that's, that's really the motivator, it seems like, even maybe more than the results. Yeah, like the runs that I'm most proud of is not like my winning run. It was just the runs that I did exactly what I wanted to do. So was that a bit of an over-rotated backflip onto kind of hard pack that just bucked him out the back seat? Yeah, hard to hold on, especially it's quite steep there. So even the slightest bit of over-rotation, you're going to bend way into the tails. And Oscar just showing his strength handling that flat air at the bottom. Well, a very direct line for Oscar Mandin. You know, two, two uh, Freeride World Tour comps, two big backflips for Oscar. So that's going to be a 55. Definitely not what he was looking for, but he put it all on the line there as Ross Tester just holding it down in the hot seat. Oscar Mende, we'll see where that ends up, but he's already got a podium run to his name here on the Freeride World Tour, and with only three events before the cut, that's an important one to hold on to. We've still got the bulk of the men's field to go. I'm sure I've got more fireworks in the reserves there. I'm looking forward to our next rider. 
Xander oh. Gouldman. Yeah, Xander is such a great rider. He's got a great spirit, lovely to be around, and one of the best and maybe unknown or more unknown riders. He was a standout as a junior, and then he kind of took some time off. He, he finished his, uh, his undergrad degree and then popped back into free ride last year and was immediately right on the top of the Challenger Tour. Um, you, you, you can't understate the skill set. Xander, kind of the forerunner to Ross. They have a very similar style, really, really strong technique, but super technical tricks as well. Uh, looking forward to Xander kind of bouncing back. He had uh, he had a bit of a wild one in Spain and then finished it off with a huge splash with a giant scream and semen. Uh, that one definitely went viral on the Freeride World Tour Instagram. Uh, Lily, you spent quite a bit of time skiing with Xander in the, uh, in the preseason this year. What's his headspace like? Oh, well, he's just, like, the biggest delight to be around, you know? He's just, like, this, like, big old puppy dog. Um, absolutely wonderful, wonderful human being. And then you're just, like, skiing behind him, and you're like, oh, this dude is messed up in the head. Like, this guy's insane. All right, well, a rookie on the free ride world tour, but no stranger to competitive free riding. He's got a uh, he's got a bronze medal under his belt from the junior world championships in 2016. Nice nolly out of the gate, kicking things off here for Xander Goldman. And he had a mid-pack result in the first event of the free ride world tour, so he's trying to sneak his way into the top ten, I think, for this one. Yeah, making a big splash and a different angle on that one. Really clean for Xander as he comes out with a ton of speed. Just looking so technical as he really lays into the angles of his turns. Yeah, loving seeing riders lay it over like that. 360, getting a little caught up out of the fall line, though, maybe slightly over-rotated. And now coming cross hill on this one, spinning and... A little bucked. He lost his foot there. Not dead clean, but still a strong start for Xander Goldman. Yeah, a little bit of a control issue, but he really is just a three-in machine. He sure is, and he's making his way over to the lookers left. Seen a lot of traffic today. There's lots of fun features out there to take the, make the most of. Really, it's just popping and locking. Every single thing is a feature to him. Yeah, now picking up speed into this lower section, looking at a long transfer backflip, getting it clean, and he still has plenty more below him. Xander Goldman, another 360, connecting with the landing, so bringing that thermometer way back up, and he is not, de oh, he is, de I was hoping he wasn't gonna air off that one. <laughs> Please, no, Xander, you had such a good run, stop. You've done enough. That was a fantastic run from him. The first two threes had some uh, slightly bucked landings. But a great finish as these two uh, Tahoe riders just comparing notes here at the bottom. Except it didn't work. <sighs> great takeoff on that one. Scopes it so perfectly, but just a little back seat riding out of it. And then this high speed backflip, connecting with the landing, wheeling out, and then in another 360 down here at speed. And this was probably the cleanest and steepest landing he found on the whole face. You see in the criteria, air and style is totally jacked. Control is a, a little less so. Um, so let's see how the judges add that all up and deliver work. the score. None of it worked. It should have. Oh, that's really frustrating. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. <laughs> so the score dropping for Xander Goodman, a 78. A solid score and Xander definitely taking advantage of the bottom half of that run, which was picture perfect. A couple of uh, wonky moments on the upper section, but the judges definitely loving it. I think we're gonna have to relook at that. I think he may have spun both ways in that run, which is extremely difficult to do for skier or snowboarder. So Ross still holding it down in the hot seat with that huge score for, especially for an early runner. But Xander Goldman definitely making a case for himself with that run. A lot of really technical freestyle elements, as you said, good skiing, couple significant control bobbles, but cleaning things up at the bottom and kind of showing us a bigger picture of Xander Goldman. Yeah, when he's able to get down a run with no control issues, he's gonna nail one of these cons. And up next, we've got Christopher Turdell, one of the most experienced riders in the ski man category. 
And uh, I would say usually extremely consistent, a beautiful skier, and it was actually very unsettling to see him lose a ski in the first event of Freeride World Tour 2023. Yeah, I think he was really surprised by that too. Just mid-turn, one of those uh, rocks buried just under a bit of fluffy snow, just took his ski, and in a pretty precarious spot as we, as we saw on the last event. But Christopher is nothing if not professional, and he's going to bounce back from that. He looks loose. He looks focused. He's ready to go. He's got two overall titles and a Verbier win in the pocket. So you know Christopher knows how to get it done and always a creative and smooth take on any competition face. And that Swedish heritage lends to handling difficult snow conditions really well. He's getting into this exposed section here, navigating through those rocks with no problem. And taking that cross fall line option and his reconnection with the snow, you almost ne never see Christopher Trudell landing flat and he's keeping that streak going. As he pops a huge backflip here, another slight over rotation, similar to Oscar Manda. I wonder if that one's a little bigger or a little kickier than they were expecting from scoping. That could explain why we've had two, from, two crashes from two backflips there. Yeah, one from Christopher nonetheless. He's like backflip champ. Yeah. So a disappointing second crash on tour for him this year. Very unusual. Yeah, really unusual to see Christopher doing anything that's not picture perfect as he makes his way down. Is he, oh, he's still got a couple of features or he's just making his way off the face now for, for Christopher Trudell. So the two-time champ, that's gonna wrap up his campaign here in Andorra. Unfortunate and really curious, a couple of question marks on that, uh, on that feature, that specific feature, as two people that I consider experts at backflips going down in almost the exact same way. I think we'll have to listen in at the finish line there and see if there's any chatter about that feature. Well, score coming in there for Trudella, 38-3-3. So not going to trouble the top spot. Just trying to eavesdrop in on the conversation between Trudell and Ross Tester. But I think Christopher Trudell, not a lot to say. As he makes his way out of the finish corral. And that's a tough day in the office for Christopher Trudell. As... Uh, not, not really quite what he was looking for. And yeah, a couple big question marks on that feature. So we get back up to the top. The next rider in the gate, well, he had, he had a, a crazy ride last year. Uh, basically starting things out with, starting things out, oh, that, I'm sorry, total miscommunication there. So we are moving back up to our brand new wild card. He is our, Newly minted Freeride Junior World Champion, a Whistler Freeride Club member now, a current <laughs> member of the club, and given the wild card onto the tour uh, based on the retirement, the surprise retirement of Imar Navarro, Marcus Gogan in the start gate for the very first time in the Freeride World Tour. This kid has had a week. He went from Freeride wor Junior World Championships, where he won, to getting to four run at Bakira Barrett yeah, in Spain Marcus, to a wild card and yeah, then only a two day gap from wild card to start gate for Marcus. So, it, I mean, a roller coaster of emotions for this young man as he finds himself in the start gate at the Freeride World Tour for the first time. That's gotta be such a mind trip going straight from juniors, just like right to the tour. Yeah. How, how do you think he's handling the hit game, Derek? Uh, he's handling it really well. I, I mean, so far, more than anything, he's excited. I've worked with Marcus since he was 11 years old as his coach, and all he is feeling right now is just burning stoke. This is where he wants to be. This was his goal from pretty much day one, so to find himself in this start gate effectively a year earlier than even his wildest dreams had, had set him up. The hope was go back, do the, do the four stars, do the challengers, follow the path, and then 
you know, being on site here really helped his, uh, helped his chances, especially with this event moving up so quickly. So Marcus Gogan, 18 years old, won the Freeride Junior World Championships a week ago in Kapol, Austria, and now in the start gate for his very first drop-in on the Freeride World Tour. He had a spectacular run that went viral from the Junior Championships, and Marcus Gogan is on course on the Freeride World Tour. And with the wealth of free ride experience at such a young age, he's coming into the super techie section, looking strong. A little redirection, shifty, and a perfect landing. That was a beautiful start to his first free ride world tour run. Yeah, taking this off the corner, hoping to lock in with some transition, and then moving around into this lower section, catching the corner of it with a huge 360, oh. but just a little short and onto his side. That was a tough reception. <laughs> yeah, the angle's just not quite matching up. And the cork seven right to his feet on that step up. So thermometer coming right back up. Marcus now just trying to get his goggles sorted out as he had a tough landing on that first one, but not letting him slow him down. A blind cork seven. That is exceptional form from Marcus and another big air. Looking so comfortable. Really just trying to sort out his vision as he comes into this long one, laying out the Jeez. backflip and connecting. Marcus Gogan, well, it wasn't perfect, but it was spectacular. What an entrance for this kid on the Free Ride World Tour. Safe to say he is right where he belongs. Yeah, it's like he had that fall and he's like, no, 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 no. Look what I can do, though. Like, <laughs> I promise I deserve to be here. <laughs> well, goggles around the neck, helmet caked with snow, but a huge grin on his face as we watch the entrance super strong, getting the shifty on this one, and then just gunning it. So you can see Aaron style, the, the bar doesn't go any higher. That one just not quite getting as far as he needed to, but that, oh, did that not stop him? Exceptional form. And what I like about yeah, this run is that it combined a really technical top section with incredible freestyle elements. I mean, his goggles are around his neck at this point. <laughs> Just crying on his way down with this enormous backflip. That has to be measured. We need uh, feedback on how big that really was. Well, that was unbelievable. Oh, certified sick as frick. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're picking our jaws up off the floor from Marcus Gogan's run. This is uh, this is going to be an interesting one for the judges, as it had everything. It had crashes. It had the drama of what's going on with his goggles. He just decided not. Nah, Out, outfit change midway through. So Ross Tester sitting on a 90, Xander no Goldman with an, you know, no another kind of wonky run on a 78 in second. And then Marcus Gogan just packing it with drama. A crash, the biggest backflip we've seen on this face so far. Uh, that had everything. And that step up, cork seven. I mean, uh, I don't even know what to say. He's giving Ross uh, Tester big props. <laughs> He's 18. 18 years old. He was a junior a week ago. Dude, that's uh, not fair. <laughs> that's not okay, man. There's some crazy shit to it for sure. All right. Well, the judges are taking their time with this, <laughs> as they, uh, you know, I, I think the criteria. Some of them are absolutely through the roof. Control definitely a pretty significant dock. But let's take a look at this cork seven. He sets it. He gets the blunt grab on the tail, coming around wheeling out his goggles are still i mean they're probably packed with snow at this point he's just deciding to abandon them the whole time just messing around with them you can see max hitzig up there in the start gate as i mean maybe he just like sent so hard on that cork sev that they just like flew off his face midair after the fall yeah I, I mean a couple of heavy heavy headed impacts on that one the 360 if he had landed that 360 that was maybe a solid challenge to ross's run but now the judge is just really trying to figure it out 
All right, well, score coming in. It's a 75 Whoa. for Marcus Gogan. So again, for a run with a crash, like a full crash in yeah. it, that's a huge score for the young Canadian rider. Big ups to Ross Tester. We're gonna see him connect one of these runs very soon, I feel, on the Freeride World Tour. Marcus Gogan wrapping up his day. A spectacular run and spectacular doesn't even begin to cut what this young man has been through. Last year, wild card into a three star. Wild card into the Challengers. Win, win. Wild card onto the Freeride Tour, Freeride World Tour with a win. Max Hicksig backing up with a fourth place uh, in Bakir Barrett. So safe to say the Austrian rider riding under the German license here to play. Yeah, we see him making his way down into the same zone as the other riders. Yeah, we saw this one with a lot of play in the snowboard category. We haven't seen too many skiers over here, but taking a much higher entrance. Super solid stomp, finding the really good landing. Yeah, you really never see Max hits it go deep. He's We've got a third taker on this backflip, nice. and Max unlocks it. So that's the first one who's been able to connect on that backflip. So clean, so crisp. And another feature here, floating a casual 360. Oh, God, you could just see his knees go all the way up to his chest on that landing. That is so flat, and he just took it. Yeah, and speaking of flat, Max finding a brand new air and connecting with that, going deep into the travel again. He just looks so effortless. It almost looks casual. Yeah, and you know that this is not a casual face, and he's just making it look like so easy. Finding the middle. This one, there's no way out except in the oh, air. Redirecting into the flats sick. and sick. Stomping. That double had a lot of uh, a lot of chatter about it. Some riders wondering if it was going to be too flat, but Max making it look well. I don't want to say easy, but definitely a strong case that that double does work. And the Austrian rider there coming through the finish. The, the effortless way that he makes these huge features look is so strong. He's a tall, tall skier and using the whole length of travel in his leg to, uh, to, to make the impossible look easy. So Max, <clears throat> Max hits a, a clean run from top to bottom and both Xander and Marcus having pretty big issues. Fluidity, maybe a little slower than, than some of the other riders, but finding a ton of features. This 360 just looking so easy and the first one to make the backflip work that we saw take out Christopher Trudell and Oscar Menda. And then this feature, nobody else looked at that. He wheelied a little, I wonder if he was a touch short and then finishing things off with this double. A little slow down so he doesn't land too low on the pad. And then taking it out into the flats. Again, getting sat down a little bit. No question that he was in control for the whole thing. All right, score coming in in 85-3-3 for Max Hitzig. So the judges loving that. Not enough to, ro to knock Ross Tester off the top, but the two other runs that were sitting in second and third before that, both Xander Goldman and Marcus Gogan with, well, I mean, Xander with a control issue and Marcus with essentially a full crash that he was able to recover from. So a clean run from Max Hitzig, putting him into second place. What an astonishing start for his uh, free ride world tour career after the roller coaster of 2022. Yeah, showing that he belongs here, playing with the big dogs. And speaking of big dogs, another Austrian rider, he and Max, uh, Valentin Rayner, he and Max traveling together. You know, they're, they're compatriots and countrymen. He had, a, he had a start on the Freeride World Tour last year, didn't make the cut, and was off to the Challengers where he was able to regain his spot here on the Tour and well-earned, if I may say, for the peak performance rider as he kicks out the start gate to see what he can do here on the face in Andorra. Working his way down the ridge there. He's been looking more and more comfortable on tour, working his way through the exposure. It's a few options to take, redirecting to take that one off the nose. Yeah, and finding a really nice connection with the landing there for Valley Rayner. 
as he is always so smooth. I love his style. Smooth, effortless, tossing the backflip there and handling it, getting his speed under control immediately upon landing. So now we're we're two up, two down on that feature. Valley Rainer with a big 360 and another beautiful connection with the landing. So Valley Teen Rainer, peak performance, big 360 again. So he's got th two 360s and a backflip in technical terrain. Valentin Rayner absolutely scorching this run. Working his way down for a massive backflip. A little backseat landing, but he pulls it off and straight lines out. So smooth for Valley Rayner. This, oh, <laughs> these guys delivering so far. Everybody looking at this giant mountain face like it's a terrain park. And if you want to follow along with Max and Valley's journey on tour, they've got a new project called Decide to Ride. And that's following their uh, experience on tour. So tune in. Episode one is out. And I guess episode two will be dropping soon after Ordino Achilles. He's got such like a big, sweet, like chiller personality. And then he just pulls stuff like that. And insane. Yeah, it's almost a Jekyll and Hyde. He's, he, he reminds me in that way of Christopher Trudell. Super calm, very level uh, in conversation. And then as soon as he gets on the mountain, he just unleashes complete change of personality into a shred monster. I think he has the most amount of uh, cozy hoodies out of anyone on the tour. I, like, it's like that's all he wears. So Aaron Style just popping with two big 360s and that backflip and finding the sweet spot on that flip. We saw it take out two backflip wizards and then this one slowing the rotation down as he pushes his feet apart and really, really clean line, clean riding there for Valley. Goes long on this backflip and he has to because there's considerable, considerable amount of rocks in the landing there. So you really got to back yourself to take some serious air time into that one. Well, the ski men's field definitely putting the judges to work now. We saw a couple of uh, a couple of really clean runs. Valley looking super emotional in the finish area as he's uh, well happy to put down a great run. And now we wait for the judges to have their say on it. The, I mean, you can't understate the the roller coaster, the emotions that the riders go through through this whole process, Lily. Yeah, yeah, he might have like something to do with his run, could be something outside in his own life influencing him. Well, Valley's just letting it all out now as he's able to, uh, to, to reflect on a great run here. Freestyle elements, the technical entrance at the top, finding a nice transition in that really steep part. And now just anxiously waiting the peak performance rider. He's got a 90 to beat from Ross Tester. The uh, extremely, extremely strong kickoff to the category after that tough fall we saw from Abel Moga. Ross stepping back up and Valley Rainer. He didn't have the result he was quite looking for in Spain. And I'd say he's definitely done his bit now to put himself right where he wants to be. All right, well, another look at this enormous backflip at the bottom. Yeah, it, using all the travel, I mean, all these athletes so strong. When we were hiking up for face check yesterday, Valley and I started almost at the same time, and I'd say he beat me on a 45-minute hike by about half an hour. He just took off like a mountain goat. Um, so Valley Rayner, yeah, just taking it all in as we wait for the scores. Ross Tester loving his spot in the hot seat. A real contrast in emotions there from the riders. As you said, there could be, uh, there's lots of factors that, that, that bring this out. And you said it, Lily, the, just the relief, the sheer relief of, of rolling through that finish gate when you put a run down like that. It's, uh, it's a huge pressure release. Yeah, to visualize like a run that good. You can see his buddies at the finish line there, keeping him strong, awaiting the score while the judges do their work. Yeah, the camaraderie between these riders uh, is just, I mean, evident here on the screen as everybody coming in for hugs. There's Max Hitzig, Abel Moga, and Ross Tester. Everybody just coming in for a hug and kind of some some comfort there for Valley Rainer as the emotions just pouring out of this young rider. 
as we wait for the score. You, you know, Lily, you said the judges really taking their time. They want to get it right. They've got a lot of criteria. And, and trying to balance the ranking with the points and everything, is that enough to knock Max, Max out? Is it enough to knock Ross out? I mean, that's in their hands, but definitely uh, Valley making a strong case for himself there. All right, and the score coming in, and Valley Rainer into first place with a 91. Oh, and now the tears turn to tears of joy as he is going to be taking the hot seat. The judges putting their time into that one, but loving the freestyle elements of that run as the Austrian rider taking over the hot seat. That really is like the only run that could have taken over Ross's run. Just trick after trick. So thrilled for Valle. He's been campaigning for two years now and uh, has been on a real roller coaster, and it's so amazing to see him there in the hot seat. Well, and to see him go from cut from the tour last year to, to battling his way back through the challengers and now into the hot seat. But we go straight back up. Verbier rider, Simon Peradon. Simon had a great start, sixth place in his very first run, doing it for the homies back in Verbier and coming in hot start here for his second run on the Freeride World Tour. One of the tallest riders that we've got on tour, and I, I think it's incredible to see such graceful skiing from someone with such long legs. It is funny that free ride really is like one of the only sports you can have anybody. Mm. It's a wonderful thing. He's taken some serious air in his top section and is working his way down into the middle of the face. So opting for a 360 into this double, really backing himself, making it clean, getting a little bit of a, of a right footer off that and avoiding the flattest part of that. Another 360, floating it out there. So Simon Peridon getting things going, keeping it hot as he moves into this low wind lip and going for a massive oh. transfer. Oh. Screaming out the bottom of the face. That is fireworks from Simon Peridon. That must have been so hard to like line up the airtime for that too. You have to really commit to going in fast. Yeah, and he's certainly committed to the speed now coming into this last one. We saw Oscar Manda, and he takes it clean. And you can see the fist bump there from Simon Peridon as he makes his way through. That was the fastest run we've seen by a long shot. He took so much pace into that enormous transfer. High fives across the board for Simon Peridon, brand new to the Freeride World Tour. He is young, and you can see the speed coming as he goes through the hard cliff. That was a great way to get things started. Fluidity absolutely jacked on this run. A nice 360 there. That second section was quite tricky, but he handles it, and the huge <laughs> transfer, spreading the legs to control his landing, and just rides out with insane pace. Oh, uh, Tabke-esque there, finding those long cross-court moves that you need a ton of speed for. 80.67 for Simon Peridon. That's gonna be good enough so far for fourth, but fourth at this stage is a precarious position as we're only nine riders in to a 23 rider field. So our current standings right now, Valley Rayner sitting in the hot seat on a 91, Ross Tester in second and Max Hitzig holding down the three top spots. All these riders just anxiously awaiting the rest of the field to come down. And there is a big threat here in the start gate. Alta Utah's own Andrew Pollard He's a free ride coach. He's a mentor. It's been a great thing to watch him go from rookie to mentor in, this, in the free ride world tour. You know, taking a lot of riders under his wings, absorbing the feelings when riders are nervous, and he is on track here. Yeah, the Pollards always bring the good vibes, and he is working his way through the exposure in the top section of the face. Nice landing there. A clean entrance into the face for Andrew, taking a different angle on that. You will never see Andrew Pollard land flat. He's just incapable of it. He only finds transition cross court, always finding the angles. And a big nice. double there for Andrew Pollard. Andrew's always the person that you go to for like help with your line because you just know that he's going to be able to see the right things in this face. And stepping up, there's only two tracks there from Ross Tester and Marcus Gogan. And Andrew Pollard continuing to move cross hill. Moving over to the look is left of the face where we've seen a lot of great features. 
And Andrew again moving cross hill with a big backflip and connection into the landing. And not done yet. Andrew redirecting here and finding another nice transition. Super smooth run for Andrew Pollard there. Absolutely textbook A Paul there on the face. I think this face really plays to his strengths where he can lace cross court airs from side to side. He's really made the most of the venue. He said he was looking forward to a run where he could swoop. <laughs> swoop? Oh yeah. Swoop? Sorry, what's a swoop? Well, those big loopy Pollard turns on the on the last event in uh, Bakir Barrett, it was a lot of tight techie turns. Didn't really uh, didn't really vibe with the with the Apol feeling. This side hill, perfect connection into the entry cliff, and you you just see when he re-enters the re-enters the ground or reconnects with the ground, it's always so smooth. And takes this one as a double. Really nice from Andrew. Super unique, Eric. Laying out that backflip and again, finding the nice goal post landing, the down sloping takeoff that is the signature of Andrew Pollard. As you can see the line tracker there, now the judges have their work cut out for them. Andrew Pollard lining with an 82.67. Gonna put him into fourth. So a strong one for A. Paul there, swooping his way through this face in Andorra. Bakir Barrett, we go right back to the top. The first of the Kiwi contingents, a bunch of Kiwis on tour this year. Manu Barnard, 21 years old, made his way from the juniors to the qualifiers, to the challengers, find his way onto the Free Ride World Tour. A little bit of a shaky start in his first stop, uh, but looking to kind of come back swinging as he makes his way into this very, very technical exposed zone. And Manu was also the last rider to drop, which adds a little pressure of its own. So might be nice for him to be dropping mid-pack this time. He finds his entrance in there. Goes a little shorter than some of the other riders, but finds a unique. Oh, end. oh like, he went short to set that up. A perfect flat three from Manu Barnard. I wondered why he was speed checking above that cliff that we saw everybody else zoom off. Well, now the answer is, oh, and oh. he just gets caught up by a snow snake there. Disappointing for Manu, but he is popping his way down. Taking a bunch of speed. You do a big 360 and almost the exact same thing we saw from Michael Mon. that there's a dish there and the upslope of it is unforgiving to land into and Manu getting eaten up by that one. That's pretty emotionally tough. Like, yeah, follow one ball with another. Yeah, for sure. It's gotta it's gotta be taxing. And you know, that first one was was just a weird one and then and then that was a little mistake on angles. Oh, and Manu just a tough day at the office there as he gets snagged by weird snow conditions in that corner. As we said, the wind transporting snow into unexpected spots gives you you know, some sometimes riders can get caught up. We saw Manu with two of those really unfortunate as his entrance into the face was one of the wildest that we've seen. For sure, he's got a solid crew and they're gonna help him uh, move through it and plan a great line for his next Freeride World Tour event. The crowd are here for it. I wonder if he's a bit sore after those tumbles. <laughs> well, there, there's your answer. That pretty much sums up that run for Manu. It's hard when the thing starts to domino too. You know, you have one little little bobble, but this is going to be a highlight reel moment. He had a little slowdown. We wondered why, and then he popped that huge flat three, and then just he dug his tip into the snow there, and it just stopped his one foot dead. And then unfortunately taking this one a little long, and you can see catching straight into the upside of that gully. Yeah, I think the secret with that feature is not to rotate too far uphill. Yeah, and, and I honestly, I think it's a little less speed. It's rare to say that on this face because so many of the rocks really project out. Um, and we saw that, you know, bothering some people last year. So a 38 for Manu Barnard there. Um, Lily, you have a bobble at the top. I mean, how much does it rattle you? Oh yeah, it's just like a big mental game of, you know, like, uh, you know your score isn't gonna be that good anyways. You get a ball up in your head. 
Well, Manu Barnard, tough day at the office for him. We're going to see him come back swinging, but we go straight back to the top. And this is exciting. I love watching everything this guy does on skis. Ralph Velpener, he's, uh, I mean, he's an Olympian. He's a slope style champion. He's got a, a second place in the Nanda free ride from a week and a half ago. Everything he does just oozes style. He has got such a yeah. unique style. And as soon as he gets into the air, it, it's it's almost unfathomable what he's able to do on his skis. He's the Italian rookie, wild carded onto the tour, 25 years old, and just a highlight reel behind him. A horrific injury ended his season last year, just before the Olympics. An incredible journey to see Ralph back on skis at this level in such a short time. And he's actually got a really strong technique background. He was an alpine racer as a kid. Uh, before going into freestyle where he had a really successful career. Unfortunately stopped by that injury that Derek mentioned just before Beijing, which took him out of the running there. Explain why he has such gorgeous turns though. Absolutely. Working through that really technical section with no issues. Lining up a big three there. Coming a little unstuck on the landing, but holding the composure to continue on his line. Yeah, cat-like recovery there for Ralph. Snow is just riddled with snow snakes today. Goes deep on that one, but comes unstuck in the landing and loses a ski, which means that is not going to be the result that he was looking for today. Disappointing for Ralph, but he's waving to indicate that he is A-OK. -okay. Oh, that was a tough way to go down for Ralph there as he, he looked like he had had the landing and then it just came undone. That is a big error. He took that well past the only other existing bomb hole. Yeah, a little bucked and then once you get your skis off fall line but your body's moving down the hill, there's not much you can do about it. So Ralph is gonna collect his ski and uh, put things back together to finish his run here on the face. But unfortunate end to that run for Ralph Velpener as uh, always, always exciting to watch. And as I said, as soon as he gets into the air, you're just like, whoa, what's gonna come? It looks like he almost had that landing for a sec and then just kind of lost it. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's a reasonably flat landing and he might have overshot and ended up in a even flatter spot. Yeah, he definitely went really, really far off that, giving himself uh, a, a significant amount of hang time. As Ralph has his ski back on, and is gonna make his way off the face here. So this ski men's field, a little bit of everything so far. We've had some absolutely spectacular runs and Ralph finding that wind lip and just adding his signature style as he makes his way through the bottom part of the face. So he looks like he's gonna pick off Another big air there. Oh, I love his air style. He just looks so swervy clean. Yeah, full swerve style for Ralph. And it just has, yeah, it's got that style element that you kind of can't manufacture. I think you either have it or you don't. And Ralph has buckets of it. All right, well, wrapping things up there for our Italian wild card, the slope style wizard, a backcountry Slope style wizard. I mean, his run, if you if you get a chance to go back and watch his run from the Nanda backcountry freestyle event, it was just absolutely mind-blowing. 22 years old, Ralph Velpiner wrapping up his run here on the Freeride World Tour. Ordino Arcalis here in Andorra delivering the goods. Snow conditions have been evolving throughout the day, throughout the week. We had a little bit of snow and then a bunch of wind and now some sun. So pretty much all the elements uh, coming into play for snow here. And we're, we are starting to see some, some odd snow snakes, you know, having a say. And speaking of stylish riders, another Olympian in the slope style discipline, this young Kiwi just oozing style, throwing down a 540 in the last event, landing switch in the off piece, extremely challenging. Finn Billis, younger brother of uh, Freeride World Tour standout, Hank Billis, 23 years old. He's a rookie on the tour. We saw him as a wild card last year in Fieberbrunn and delivered one of the hottest moments with the Cork 7. And now Finn Billis on course, the nollie out of the gate, getting himself fired up for this run. 
enjoyed a breakfast with Finn this morning, and his spirit, he, he said he's, there's no point in being nervous. It's just a waste of energy, and he's putting himself right into the guts of this thing, going ultra technical. He may have the freestyle background, but we haven't seen anybody enter through that zone. And Finn with the 360, perfect connection into the landing. So Finn Billis absolutely slaying the top section through the heart cliff now. Really bringing the heat, Finn Billis. He's got the slope style background, but his his pedigree in free ride is second to none, taking on this one, floating in another nice connection. So Finn Billis making a strong case for himself today. Working his way over to the lookers left with a big floaty three over the wind lip. Looking silky smooth, buttering his way over. Everything he does, he does with style. And this run, so far, blending beautifully the combination of free ride and freestyle. Landing switch, staying switch now. Finn Bill is coming into this lower section, continuing to ride switch with a floaty switch 180. So Finn bringing his own personal stamp onto this. Another massive 360. The hits just keep on coming for Finn Billis. No. What is he lining up for this one? Hand drag three, sick one from Finn Billis. What an incredible run. Well, all elements taken care of in that run, just ticking boxes, top to bottom. Finn Billis took the feedback he got from the judges from the last event, saying, if you're gonna ride switch, show us you're in control. Well, guess what? He did. He took that back to the drawing board, went into the lab, and came up with a run that had features nobody else hit, so technical at the top, and then just packed with tricks in the most difficult places. So a big air there, perfect landing, displaying incredible skiing in between features, massive cross court 360. And so low to the ground, but just really backing it up and then popping to switch here. And he stays switch for such a long time and able to land. Look how blind that takeoff is from above. Imagine skiing into it backwards and then perfect switch 180. And then this, I mean, just connecting with the ground and then still more. Unbelievable form from Finn Billis. You can see air and style and control is so jacked. Yeah, that was an incredible run for Finn, and you can tell he is proud of it. He was so low stress at breakfast this morning, just cruising into the day, knowing he had that in his pocket and certainly had the skills to execute it. What a great way to come back from a bit of a tough one in Spain. Finn Billis is showing he has exactly what it takes on the free ride tour, free ride world tour, but still so different from everything else we've seen. <laughs> That's why I like to see, oh, let's see what he's got to say. on the way in, had to. Yeah, always fascinating, the finish line chat. So Finn Bill is into fourth with that with an 83.67. The judges definitely enjoying what they saw from the young Kiwi rider, slope style Olympian, and here on the Free Ride World Tour with a spectacular highlight reel run. All right, well, we continue on through this ski men's field. Right now, we have Valley Rainer, Rally, Valley Rainer sitting on top on a 91. Ross Tester with a 90. That was a close one for the judges. And then our Austrian-German rider, Max Hitzig, sitting in third on the 83. So all of these men really, really putting their stamp on, on the face. And then we've got uh, Finn Billis just behind Max. So lots and lots yet to come as we go straight back to the top. Jed Kravitz. Jed had an, uh, a bit of a tough entry into uh, the Freeride World Tour, looking for a strong comeback. He's been filming and releasing his Ski for the Love project. Absolutely magic. 34 years old, Jed Kravitz, a realtor out there in, uh, in Truckee, California, but he's got a deep bag of tricks, such a strong rider. He was the overall number one last year on the Challenger Tour in Region 2, and he is on course here in Andorra. And displayed some incredible skiing in the first stop, but as you said, had got a little unstuck in one of his landings. So he's got a 19th from Becerra Barrett and is under a little bit of pressure to bring a strong result home today. 
Yeah, and here is where he is right at home in these technical big mountain sections, popping off that one with a nice clean re-entry to the ground. Jed Kravitz now picking up speed as he makes his way over towards this rider's right side of the venue. Looking very relaxed on snow. Looking for his next feature, big 360, perfect landing. Now Jed Kravitz into the heart of this feature, right off the top, finding a nice connection and picking up a whole bunch of speed into this windlip. Shifting his way over to the lookers left of the venue. And now Jed coming into this far rider's right. We've seen this deliver some spectacular moments already. We saw A. Paul flip that little flat spin there for Jed, crossing over and now still has some more features underneath him. A big 360 and reconnecting and just not able to hold onto it, but able to stop himself before that rock face. Yeah, oh. that was a good arrest there and a consequential crash. Yeah, taking that 360 really long, maybe just a touch two riders left for the reconnection. There is a nice transition there that we've seen other riders pick up, but not quite able to hold on on that long 360 there for Jed Kravitz. Yeah, I think the flat three was almost too short. That one was a little shy, so I think he put the, put the foot on the gas for that one and maybe overshot it slightly. Well, ski for the love indeed. Jed Kravitz always smiling as he has uh, immediately become uh, a fixture on the tour. Just a lovely guy to be around as Valley comes out for a hug. Yeah, Getting the high safety on that 360, entering in, and then this flat three. Just gets it round, which I think might be the motivating factor by, to take that one so long and just land a little back seat. Yeah, just a little smushed. And then I, I'm really happy that he was able to control his speed before he ran into that next rock. As we see, score come in there for Jed, a 48-3-3 for Jedediah Kravitz. So that's a tough one. He's definitely gonna be feeling the pressure as we move into kicking horse, gonna be looking for a big result there. And that th these kind of things can really weigh on a rider as they, as they move from event to event. So we see the whole face here, the Peak de las Planas. On, uh, on the back side of the Ordino Arcalis Ski Resort. This resort is just so full of, of great venue options, but we have no breaks here as the heat just keeps getting turned up. Peak performance rider, Max Palm. He's got a win a week, less than a week, four days ago uh, in Bakira Barret. He won there last year. He came here last year and had a big crash that actually ended up putting him out for the rest of the season. So Max Palm is gonna be looking for redemption here in Andorra as he is looking to put himself kind of in position to take a stranglehold on the rankings. And taking the spicy entrance that's getting a lot of traffic and so degrading somewhat. Redirecting and pulling a 360 there, stomps it. So clean. Max put a ton of work in at the gym this summer, and you can see he's bulked up a bit. He's way stronger, and you see it in his riding as all of a sudden now the tall, lanky Max Palm is a beast of a man with a gigantic backflip and absolutely perfect, perfect landing for Max Palm as he continues. No slowing down with the transfer here. Very clean riding from Max Palm. Massive 360, holds it together and is just riding out of the face full of joy. A tiny, tiny bobble on otherwise a perfect run for Max Palm. So strong, that backflip way out into the flat. Oh no! Oh, Max Palm getting rocked down below. I'm not sure what happened. The drone was super high and we couldn't get the detail on it, but Max Palm going down in the flats on the outrun, meters from the finish line. Oh, what a turn of events here for Max Palm as he is, uh, that's gotta be heartbreaking for him. Absolutely heartbreaking. The judging line is at the finish corral in this event. So as we see, he throws a little slash turn and the ground drops away while his tails are loaded up. 
Uh, Lindsay Jacob Ellis moment there for Max Palm as it all goes sideways at the very, very bottom of the face. All the hard bits done, and Max Palm with a slash turn, and the ground just rolled away from him right when he was bellying out, and unfortunately dead sideways, not able to revert back into the fall line. Oh, that's a heartbreaker for Max Palm. Linking incredible features, this massive backflip is just absolutely textbook. And then lining himself up for this 360, popping over the lower shelf, getting a little bit sat down, but luckily he's been putting the time in on the squats. So the line score through the roof, Aaron Style, of course, but then the big fall at the bottom with a dead stop and Max with a 60 point run. So the Andorra stop for Max Palm continues to be a snake bite in an otherwise stellar competition career. Valley Rainer can't believe it. Max Palm, I mean, that was definitely going to be in the conversation for the top spot on the podium as Max did it all. But unfortunately, coming undone in the finish flats, that is a free ride coach's nightmare. Well, the battle of the Maxes. We've got Max Hitzig sitting high on the ranking. We just saw a banging run from Max Palm and our reigning Freeride World Tour champion and the reigning first place finisher from this exact event one year ago, Maxime Chablot in the gate. He said he put down a safety run in the last event in Spain, which didn't look that safe to me. It was good enough for fifth place in a very strong field. He's only 21 years old. He's got one season on the tour, and he already has a title in his pocket. What an incredible start for Maxime Chablot. Let's see if he can back up his victory from last year here today. An absolute super talent on tour, already feeling like a veteran in his second year. He's working his way down the ridge, entering through this rutted out, pretty nasty little chute here. Yeah, the high line above exposure, taking that cross court one that we saw. Oh, and getting a little bit sat down on that one. We saw Max Hitzig go up there, and now Max, Maxime through the heart cliff and picking up a ton of speed, going for the step up, and he makes it perfectly. That was his move last year, the only man to do it so far. That step up is so committing as if you're at all short, you're gonna pancake into the wall. So Maxime Chablot now with a ton of speed coming down the ridge. Big seven, stomps it clean. Well, the Cork 7, Maxime becoming known for that. We've seen a few of them in comp runs from him. Not too many other riders, only Marcus Gogan opting for that one today. And Maxime Chablot now, another huge speed pickup as he goes for a double backflip. And, and he stops, stops it. Perfectly. Maxime Chablot speeding off this next one, connecting with the ground. Oh, Maxime Chablot. He has put down a run for the books. Wow. <laughs> really making a campaign for the top spots of this event. Well, we saw in Kicking Horse last year, one rider do a cork seven and one rider do a double backflip, but we never imagined we'd see a rider do both in the same run. So Maxime Chablot has got to have now uh, Valley Rainer's heart fluttering as he's got all the pieces, the really technical entrance as he comes high on this one. This would be the only blemish on that run. He got sat down pretty hard there, but then the step up, Anna, he's so far. Yeah, such a variety of components that he's stacked into this run. That is incredible. I mean, makes a critical turn just after the landing. And then the double backflip, perfect landing. Wondering what he was going to do with all that speed. We saw A. Paul flip that one going probably half the pace. So when you saw him just hit the gas there, it was a big question. So Maxime Chablot, he's pleased with that one. All right, well, silence. Take a while. <laughs> he just said this could take a while. Yeah, the judges have their work cut out for them. Very different parts of the face, very differently executed runs. Maxime's run had that one slight mark against it at the very top off that upper cliff where he did get sat down. Valley Rainers was picture perfect top to bottom, but put a cork seven and a double backflip in and we've got a conversation. A <laughs> Not a dream anymore. <laughs> 
So Maxime saying he's had the dream of doing the double backflip for a while. Fuck, we saw the fucking backflip on. Max Palm executed last year twice, and he knows, he knows that wasn't perfection. But will it be enough? Will it be enough with all the elements that that had to unseat Valley Rayner from the hot seat? The judges are going to be putting their time in on this one. He's got a big back slap in it, so definitely a significant issue. But the rest of it was just so picture perfect and so big, everything he did. I mean, the distance he traveled on that double flip was, was enormous. And the step up, again, had to absolutely nail the timing, the speed, the direction. Yeah, and I would say he did that step up actually better than he did last year. Last year, he kind of overshot it a little bit and had to really kind of heavy set the landing to get himself back into control to make his way down the ridge. But that time, the reconnection was so perfect, it almost looked like he hadn't left the ground. It's the nice thing about step ups, when they go right, they feel great. You just don't want them to go wrong. <laughs> Dude, dein Run was so sick. Dude, ich hab beim, bei deinem ersten Becky so beim Takeoff war ich so, okay, crash. <laughs> Und dann einfach. Ja, die haben viel zu sehr geschmissen. Ja. Ja. Boom! Aber es sind viele dort. Das ist verwirrt. Well, if you speak German, you can get a behind-the-curtain look at this uh, conversation between these two young riders. Maxime Chablot hailing from the German-speaking bit of Switzerland. So he's able to uh, just have a nice conversation there with Austrian Valley Rayner as we wait for the judges' score to come in. We see Valley, Ross Tester, Max Hitzig. That's your top three. Finn Billis and Apol very close behind. And then we move down. Uh, Max Palm, unfortunately, coming unstuck on uh, on the flats. Marcus Gogan with a spectacular entry into the Freeride World Tour at 18 years old. So it was hard to... It Here it is, Maxime Chablot with an 88-3-3. Right. So a solid score for a run with a back slap, and the judges definitely giving him credit for the rest of that run, which was absolutely spectacular. Such a great run. Maxime Chablot is going to clean that up, and I'm sure we're going to see him come out swinging when we get to Kicking Horse. Well, I mean, everyone who comes out of this start gate could win this event. Many of them have wins under their belt. This is a huge one to watch and nervous moments for Valley Rayner. Craig Murray, every single time he kicks out of the start gate, you never quite know what's gonna happen. It's gonna be different from what we've seen from the other people. So Craig Murray, the Kiwi rider, on course right now. Silky smooth through the exposure here. And he's under a bit of pressure to bring home a result today. Big 360, just makes it over that rock buttress, perfectly timed. Yeah, really sharp angle on that takeoff for Craig Murray. And then just getting a touch inside, but needing to redirect immediately to get over to his next feature, coming up on the sidewall of this one. Takes it deep, a bit of a backseat landing, but he's carrying on, carrying some speed into this cross-court hit. And that's where you want to land if you're going to 360 that one. Craig now coming back in the other direction with a bunch of speed as he makes his way down into the lower section. This one is riddled with features. A huge backflip connecting with the landing. Craig Murray, happy to see him lace a clean run from top to bottom as he still has more to come. He's going over for this extra credit feature with a bunch of speed going, oh, yeah, that one is such a flat landing, and uh, I think he took more speed than the previous riders in there. Well, yeah, you only have to look at the bomb holes. He was a, at least four ski lengths further than the other two riders going off that extra credit. That one gets flat really, really quickly, and Craig Murray, unfortunately, not able to hold on to what was otherwise a great run. He'll be disappointed with that one, but always all smiles and good vibes. <laughs> Bit of a loose one indeed, just dodging that rock buttress and his landing there. Getting the shifty and then a little bit inside, but kind of throwing the body. And then this one, you could see the difference there with Craig Murray. He didn't pop. He let his legs go soft and come up into that 360. And then this backflip was ginormous perfectly executed and then unfortunately Craig going over to the extra credit 
you know, we were chatting about it in, in face check, a bunch of riders calling that the dream killer as it's so flat, some riders feeling the pressure to add to the line score, to, to, to put another feature in at the bottom, and Craig just going too fast off that. And unfortunately, taking it too long, and it's a little too flat, even for Craig Murray, who's one of the strongest riders on the tour. So 55, thank six, you. seven for the Kiwi. Craig Murray saying thank you to everyone out there watching, supporting. We know we're gonna see more and more great things from that young Kiwi rider. If you get a chance to check out his van, it's pretty special. All right, we have a local wild card here from the Ordino Arcalis free ride team, Iker Reyes. Iker getting ready to kick things off in spectacular fashion. He's 25 years old, granted a wild card into this event, and Iker Reyes is on course at his home resort. Yeah, Iker is a ski instructor here and a big part of the free ride community. He's a repeat offender in the jam extreme here and has taken home a second place before. He looks pretty comfy up there in the exposure, working his way through. Yeah, I love this technical entrance, putting himself above this cliff that we've seen get a lot of play. Eker finding the transition there with a nice clean stomp, getting on that right foot to get way out here on the skier's left side. A unique take on this section, getting this lower piece and coming up short. Oh, Eker Reyes not quite with enough speed on that one. As we, we, we've kept hitting on all day so many of these cliff features protrude way further out than the riders think from from the visual inspection and Eker coming up short on that one happy to see him taking that that uh, rock strike with his feet though and he's moving well I think that was no issue for him so maybe just needed a little bit more curry on that one because he takes it absorbs the impact with his knees yeah. loses his ski well short on that one, but did well to, as you said, and absorb it and, and keep himself upright because he was just, just clearing the next shelf of rock. And you can see even from this, from this angle how far out the distance actually was. And I think he needed a bit more speed and quite a bit more pop, as you, uh, as you mentioned. That, that exactly shows the distance that he had to carry. And unfortunately, coming up a little short for the local Andorran wild card. Happy to see him up on his feet and collecting his gear here for, for Eker. And a, a, a big, big splash here. To, I mean, what an incredible amount of pressure for a young rider to be thrust onto the world stage with the likes of Ross Tester, of Valley Rayner, of, of Max, well, all the Maxes. Um, yeah, just a real, a, that's a big day when you're the local free ride coach to come out and play in this field. Yeah, he mentioned to me at the riders meeting last night that, you know, it's his absolute dream to compete on the world tour. So a huge opportunity for him and just to get in the right head game. I think he's been competing in free ride competitions here, but it's it's expensive to travel to all of the events around Europe. So pot potentially not the most experienced rider on the hill. Yeah, and that kind of showing just that shorting that one. I mean, it was uh, these riders put a lot of faith in their scoping and their ability to, to do that visual inspection and, and to catch the distance of a feature like that from visual inspection only is really tricky. And whether he knew the distance and just didn't quite execute properly or, or he actually just kind of underrated how far he had to go. Um, but either way, Iker Reyes through the finish arch in a free ride world tour competition at his home resort. That's a huge, huge step for this, uh, this young man. And the local community is definitely going to be holding him up on their shoulders this evening. All right, well, the entire Peak de las Planas there in your view as we slowly zoom back in to the start gate at the top of this. Completely convex, it rolls away, so the riders have next to no view of the face below them. Peak performance, Scott Ryder, uh, he's, he's, he's a lot of people's bet towards the overall, definitely doing himself a big favor with a podium finish in the first event. Is this uh, you know, 29 years old, Carl Regner Erickson, on track right now and looking to back up his podium finish in the first event. 
part of the Swedish contingent that are just really outstanding athletes. They've been out jogging and training all through the tour and skiing their hearts out, taking that one big in cross court, cruising out with incredible control. Yeah, come to know that as the Swedish entrance on the Peak de las Planas is now Carl redirecting, shrimping out that backflip, getting a little bit of a backslap, but back up and holding direction as he speeds through this lower section, wondering if he was if he had more control, if he had a little something more planned in there. Pretty wild 360 there, but manages to pull it together. It's not the finessed riding that we're used to from Carl Regner Eriksson. Yeah, Carl, typically one of the smoothest riders on tour, definitely finding the limit, finding the edge, and popping another big backflip into this landing, bouncing out of it, and Carl wrapping things up. I mean, that the, the head game to be able to, after that other backflip, getting bounced and rocked, and now he is just flying down towards the finish line. Yeah, a bit of a ragged rodeo ride there for Carl Regner Eriksson. Uh, uncharacteristic, as we're used to seeing him be super, super smooth. But uh, top to bottom, a lot of action in that run. Yeah, I'm anticipating a pretty jacked Aaron style, but maybe control less so. <laughs> You heard it from him, so sketchy. I think the snow conditions are pretty tricky out there today for ski men. Yeah, Carl catching a lot of speed out of that cross court air on the Swedish entrance. And then he really threw that hard, like when he set it, and, and then trying as, as best he could with everything he had to slow down the rotation. But at this point, I think Carl now just trying to not accidentally fly off any of those jagged looking cliffs and taking that one a little too far as we've seen time and again on this face and then still going for the big backflip at the bottom a slight back touch on that one as well so carl regner erickson a ragged run uh top to bottom <laughs> he's he's got a, a a bit of a smile on the finish area he's probably feeling pretty happy to be intact score coming in there a 70.33 for carl so that's going to slide him into 10th uh we'll see we'll see how carl comes back from that in the next event as we've we've seen him have crashes and then come back with massive results right after. So I, I think one of the highlights or, or hallmarks of the Swedish team is their ability to reset, regroup, and then come back looking like nothing ever happened. The, the smooth riding we'll, we'll see again from Carl for sure. So this uh, Ordino Arcalis face in Andorra delivering everything delivering all the feelings and all the different results here. Jamesa Hampton, this is his second season on the tour. He was uh, unfortunate to suffer a knee injury after re-qualifying um, into, into the finals. But uh, Jamesa Hampton looking to solidify his spot on the tour here with a strong run and one, of a, a one member of a very strong Kiwi team here on the Freeride World Tour. Yeah, they're a great team, always looking out for each other, helping pick their lines and he's taken that sketchy entrance into that big air takes it deep yeah over all the bomb holes which at this stage of the event is seems like a really smart strategy for Jamesa as he takes this set takeoff 360 oh, holding it on just holding on looked like he was tipping to the inside now Jamesa just shedding some speed before he gets bounced into this long one taking that one deep so Jamesa with a ton of speed in this run he is handling those rough conditions. Little backseat landing there, but he's on his feet. Yeah, slight uphill trajectory there out of that landing and now making his way over to the rider's left side while oh, coming back. There's a double down here that we've seen, but this backflip jump definitely bringing a lot in, taking it sideways and oh! A little over rotated there and getting the knees way up into his body cavity, hopefully not into his face there for Jamesa as tossing that Lincoln loop, push, pushing the limits of what his body can do for Jamesa Hampton. Yeah, just really testing out that new knee of his. Hopefully it's feeling good and he's ready for a big hug from the Kiwi crew in the finish corral. Yeah, that was a big impact there for Jamesa. The rest of the run looking really, really strong. And that, that one at the bottom has shown to be extremely challenging. And I do wonder, he's got a mohawk there of snow on his helmet. I do wonder if as we're moving through the later runners in this category, if the snow conditions are starting to play a part. I think so, it's certainly changing. 
beautiful, but then in the landing, as you say, he got really inside, but held it together. Yeah, and taking that one, maybe just a slight over rotation into the uphill, and then this one has just been gobbling people up as he tosses it over the side, and then, yeah, it looks like his knees just unable, or his legs unable to handle that impact, as he was a little off angle, maybe slightly over rotated. Oh, I think you're quite right. Workout, man. <laughs> so so hard. Going for it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good great uh, Backbone. Well, Jamessa. Waving to the crew at home as the judges tabulating that one. It had a bit of everything. Some really, really glorious moments. And then that, that tough, tough finish so to at the bottom as he high. impacts into the snow. <laughs> Only three Observe. riders to go Observe. here in the ski men's field and Observe. in the day here in Ordino Arcalis, part of the Grand Valera Resorts Complex. And Dora delivering once again on the Free Ride World Tour. This has become a main, mainstay in the free ride world we've got a junior competition coming up here in the same resort on saturday so the whole free ride world just gathered here so if you're visiting andorra this weekend be sure to come and check out the juniors and cheer on the next generation of free ride all right well straight back up to the last member of team sweden the godfather of the free ride world tour, taking everybody under his wing. He's everyone's mentor, 40 years old. He's been on the free ride world yeah, tour for 15 years. And he said he's been competing at free ride for 20 years. And in typical Raina Barker at fashion, he said, what am I still doing here? Always self deprecating, but such a strong skier and such a backbone of the community. Taking the Swedish entrance, as you said, and just riffing out with those strong legs that we all know. So trademark speed here for Rene Barkered. Quick direction change and a solid backflip. Rene Barkered, he's, he's evolving as a free rider, but he never lets go of the pace. High speed riding, taking a much lower line on this one and avoiding the uphill side of that, uh, that landing that's eaten up so many riders. Rene Barkered really looking strong here as he makes his way past the one that took out a few others and potentially into this lower double. Really smart riding, redirecting right on Max Hitzig's track and stomping Rene Barker with such a solid run. That was fast paced and stacked features. Really stoked for Rene on that one. Yeah, and bringing the freestyle element, it feels like you kind of have to, even in the techie big mountain sections these days, the tricks are a mainstay on the free ride world tour. And Reyna, you know, he's had a few bits of bad luck with backflips of Verbier a couple years ago, over-rotating, over-rotating one in the last event in Bakira Barrette, but that time finding the exact right pace for his rotation and perfect execution to his feet. And the rest of his run was just classic Barker at free ride in Fall line, the, the big double bit. at the bottom, every piece of that, even that turn into the backflip was just so perfect. An epic skiing in between features there. Absolutely railing it. Yeah, his body just stacked over his feet, top to bottom, never put a foot out of place. And then this double, he got to go so slow off the first one, that little redirect and then flying long, landing right next to Max Hitzig's track. So solid, solid skiing. Excellent execution for Raina Barkered. Big category, he said. And the score coming in for Raina with a 72 6 7 for Raina Barkered. So that's good enough for 10th. Is he going to be able to hold on to the top 10? We'll see. There's only one man left at the top of the face, and he's going to have a big say in this conversation as we wind down the ski men's competition. Oh, I'm sorry, two riders left at the top of the face. I'm doing my best, but I'm definitely not the crispest chip in the bag. So Jack Nichols, the cat, Jack the cat, he's always got a different take. We saw him with an enormous transfer on this face last year. I asked him if he was gonna do it again. He said, he was a little nervous about it because he had felt sketchy, but Jack Nichols with a spectacular run in Verbier last year and locking down an 11th place in the first of event of the year. We've seen he's got huge backflips. He's got the side flip Lincoln loops on lock, doing them in places that just don't make sense. So Jack the Cat, Nichols on course. We saw a really consistent riding from him last winter with 
four top ten finishes, taking the Swedish entrance in so smooth and heading over to a new section of the face. Yeah, going way across here as he's going to take this one on a cross-court angle with a really nice transition. No flat landings for Jack as he makes those long legs uh, give a, just an effortless vision to the skiing. Big 360. Nice connection into the landing as he comes across a fall line one now, picking up a ton of speed, going for the massive transfer, stepping down and landing it. Jack Nichols making very short work. Oh, and trying to get rid of the speed so he could get to the extra credit. We heard that face was icy and Jack Nichols just getting rattled out of his turn. That lump there, we're, we've been told, is just absolutely icy. I'm, I'm surprised that's the first incident we've seen on that section of the face because it's a really difficult place to get an edge, let alone wash speed. Yeah, just unable to, to, to control the speed. And we saw with Craig Murray, you don't want to go into that lower hit too fast because it gets very flat very quickly. So Jack Nichols just unable to control the speed up on that icy side hill. A big hug there from the hot seat man himself, Valley Rayner, as he has been sitting there for a while. I don't know how you got the balls to do Nice 360 there and just beautiful turns between all of the features. And here's where he just lets go of the reins and floats that long transfer. And then unfortunately, Jack, with all that speed coming into that lower lump, yeah, we get another look at how far he traveled. His track going miles past the next track, and that was from a different takeoff. And then just unfortunate for Jack Nichols that he wasn't able to manage the speed on that icy side slope there as he was trying to get over to the extra credit feature at the bottom. So I think Valley Rayner can be comfortable in his hot seat spot uh, from Jack Nichols' challenge there with a pretty big issue at the lower section. The rest of it was really, really solid. So Jack Nichols now, we're just waiting for the score to come in. Judges deciding where that's going to sit in this overall field. Yeah, I think he'll have significant control docks from that little washout on the icy section. But yeah. of course, the, the, the rankings and the scores through the mid-pack and the bottom of the pack are also really important for the overall ranking of the season. So the judges are paying close attention to every feature he packed in and of course any issues he had you can see the look on jack's face there a bit of disappointment as that wasn't he didn't go down on a feature but just in a turn in really really um, changeable snow there are so many different snow conditions on this face and we are seeing it now come into play with these riders as as they are trying to navigate all the different kinds of snow And Jack got 11th in Bikera Barrette, so strong mid-pack result. I'm sure he was looking to bump a little bit up in this event today, but I think that's unlikely given that washout on the ice. Yeah, we kind of lost him in the snow cloud there, so it was hard to tell exactly how severe that was. Um, but the judges, you know, they've got the, the high-powered binoculars on the riders, not just watching it on a little screen. So they will know exactly what went on there. I mean, he came into there with so much speed that it was, it just, when the snow conditions change like that from slush to wind buff to actual ice, it's really hard to manage the changing conditions when you're going that fast. Jack, dude, you got a heater. That was so good, Buckley, man. Thanks. Well, you can just hear the riders congratulating each other as they stand in front of the backdrop here waiting for the scores and taking their time with the score for Jack Nichols as we wait for the judges to factor in all the criteria. Score coming in there, 13th for Jack Nichols with a 59-3-3. So unfortunately, not the big result he was looking for for Jack Nichols, the, the tall man out of Vail, Colorado, going to head back and that is one more challenger fended off so valley rainer for sure going to be in the top two there is only one man left in the start gate alaska's leaf mama made a huge splash delivering the peak performance radical moment made a big splash with the ladies uh, out in tv land there apparently uh, really picking up on leaf's vibes so yeah uh, leaf if you're you're watching they're out there indeed making a splash winning hearts and minds with his radical moment and 
Starting in quite aggressively there. Not wasting any time working through the exposure with some short turns. Well, this is what we've come to expect from Leaf Mama. Aggressive skiing and taking a totally different direction there. Perfect connection and right back to that beautiful skiing. Those turns, just a coach's dream as he's going for that long one that took Iker out, but a different uh, different trajectory on it. Perfectly executed now. They've coming through with a huge transfer and st oh! Going down in the landing, I think it's incredibly flat there <clears throat> and uses, yeah, just so much energy to absorb as you land. Yeah, unfortunate lineup there for Leaf as the rest of it was going so well. This was looking like a podium contending run as we see Leaf now just sweeping through the lower bowl with those trademark Leaf Mama turns. That is a heartbreaker as the top section of that was fireworks and looking ready to deliver another radical moment. But, you know, he ma he made a very strong debut in Bikera Barret. He got eighth in eighth position, which is a strong start for a rookie on tour. So he's got he's got time. He's got another event before the cut, and I think he can bring it home. Oh, yeah. Leaf Mama, you can't count him out. His skiing delivers those moments. And unfortunately, there, just a bit of trajectory, maybe even a bit of a distance error. We'll get another look at it. High fives for the last man in the field. So that's going to do it for the day. And, and I feel confident to say that Leafs run is not going to knock Valley Rayner out of the hot seat, which means we have another oh, first time winner. Good. Let's get a look back at this, Anna. <laughs> Silky smooth riding. An amazing airtime. I think that was just too flat. Yeah. I think it was just too flat to land. The scoping on this on this venue, extremely yeah. difficult for the riders to pick out where the transitions are. A little bit snowy uh, for Leaf, but he's got that trademark big Alaskan smile. Always a great spirit here on the Freeride World Tour and a, a huge addition to the, to the family. As Leaf, yeah, oh man, that's how we feel too. So Leaf with the 43-3-3, dropping him into 18th, which gives us the confidence to say that Valley Rayner is going to take the win here in Andorra. Ordino Arcalis delivering for the young Austrian. And the crowd goes wild for him. Big hugs from Ross Tester. All right, well, let's see what the day gave us here in the ski men's field. Our podium is Valley Rayner, Ross Tester, and Maxime Chablot, three of the heaviest heavy hitters in a field of heavy hitters. Those three locking it down. Max Hitzig backing up his fourth with another fourth, and Finn Billis moving way up into fifth with a really creative freestyle packed run. A Paul, Simon Peridon, another rookie looking good, and Xander Goldman rounding things out. And then we kind of move down into this lower section uh, of the finish. All of these riders having pretty significant control issues. We see Carl Rigner Eriksson there in 11th and all the way down. Manu Barnard having a day, unfortunately, and Abel Moga, uh, the first man in and really kicking things off with a bang, but unfortunately the no score is Albel going down. So here we have our top three riders. They all built incredible freestyle components into their runs and displayed epic skiing through heavy exposure. Let's check out how this shook up the rankings. Here we go. So Maxime Chablot shoots to the top with Max Hitzig two fourth places, sliding him into second. And Max Palm is in third position there. Valle Reina is now in the mix in fourth. And yeah, we've got a lot of Kiwis back here at the back of the pack. They've got some work to do. And a bunch of Americans, Xander Guldman, Jack Nichols, Leaf Mama, they're all gonna be really bringing the heat for Kicking Horse. Yeah, and those points tallies are very, very tight. We see at the top and in the mid-pack, the, the riders facing the cut. It's all extremely close together. So we're going to head down to the finish area and check in with our winner, Valley Rainer. Valley, describe the run you put together and how you're feeling right now. 
Yeah, my run was, I think it went pretty good actually. Like I waited so long for this moment to finally put one down and now ending up in that in that first spot of the, of the podium, like I'm, I'm speechless. And this whole run, run was for my good friend, Jeffy, who passed away in an avalanche just a few days ago. And this is for you. This is for you, my friend. That's, That's beautiful, beautiful, Valet. I'm sure Shofi is going to be shining down at you and so proud of what you've put together today. We're so thrilled to see you put down a line that you're really proud of and sending you lots of love. So Valet, just describe how you put that together because it was a really creative take on the face and you were absolutely packed with re freestyle elements but a real big mountain feel at the top. I actually only knew my takeoffs and I, I knew I would want, would want to do some freestyle tricks but then like doing two two backies and two 360s was more of a spontaneous move but yeah all the takeoffs looked really good and so I was pretty stoked to go three backy three backy a I'm huge stoked. congratulations to Valley Rayner as he takes his first win on the Free Ride World Tour in convincing fashion the peak performance rider doing it for his friend and an emotional day for Valley Rayner as we take a look back at the highlights from this run. Absolutely spectacular. Backy three, backy three. Valley Rayner, a new winner on the Freeride World Tour. Well, an unbelievable day here in Andorra. Ordino Arcalis delivering once again, the riders delivering once again, snowboard women kicking us off, ski men closing out the day. What a day we had. It's been absolutely incredible. The riders have done amazing work out there on the face, challenging snow conditions that certainly changed throughout the competition. So mad props to all the riders for throwing down. All right, well, now it's your time to get involved. The rider of the day. You're going to vote at vote.freerideworldtour.com for who you felt had the best run, the best day. All categories are in play. Who do you love out there? You let us know. The rider of the day. Vote now. Vote often, and we'll get the results out to you as soon as possible. Well, it's been a massive day here in Andorra. Huge thanks to Anna Smoothie, to the whole crew, to the riders. We've had a fantastic time. We cannot wait to see you in Kicking Horse. That's it for us here in Andorra from the Freeride World Tour. <laughs>